With GLOBE, our steps can lead us to millions of doors opening, millions of paths unfolding, and millions of reasons to keep going. Now's the time to be with a network that gets better every day for you. Malaki ang apekto sa amin ng pandemic. Bagsak ang negosyo namin pero sinagit kami ng online selling. Kung hindi siguro dahil sa Globe, wala eh kasi nagtry ako ng iba. Wala eh. Very reliable ang network nila. Because so much of our lives are online, if you get disconnected, Ready for our presentation, kids? Do you even exist? Welcome to the Red Life. Introducing Red Fiber. 100% fiber internet. A life with reliable connection. With flexible plans for different lifestyles. No worries of getting cut off. And dependable customer service. So when it matters most, you're always ready. Good job, Jacob. Get ready for the red life. Red Fiber. Reliability redefined. Sa aming mga nagla-livestream, mahalaga yung maayos na koneksyon. Nakakaya pag naglalagang signal. Malaki na ang iba ngayon. Okay na yung 4G eh, pero mas lalang gumanda ng 5G. Our livestream will not be possible kung hindi manakas ang signal ng globe. Yung alam ko na 15 to 20 Mbps na speed, na doble na pala. Partita, 4G lang ang gamit ko nito. Ang laking bagay kasi pag yung video calling sa streaming, hindi naglalag. Pati yung pag-feed namin sa base, sobrang smooth na din. Ever since I'm using Globe, kaya kitang-kita ko ang improvement na network. Because so much of our lives are online, if you get disconnected, Ready for our presentation, kids? Do you even exist? Welcome to the Red Life. Introducing Red Fiber. 100% fiber internet. A life with reliable connection. With flexible plans for different lifestyles. No worries of getting cut off. And dependable customer service. So when it matters most, you're always ready. Good job, Jacob. Get ready for the red life. Red fiber. Reliability redefined.
Good morning everyone. Maisang mapagpalang umaga po sa ating lahat. Uh, we are and welcome to the National Multi-Secular Summit for Educational Transformation and Academe Alumni Industry Government Collaboration known as UST AAIG 2021 Summit. I am Yayet, I am Dr. Clarence Batan, I'm a sociologist, and I'm a proud Thomasian, a graduate of 1995, a Bachelor of Arts in Sociology, and I am here to be your moderator for today. Uh, I will be responsible for this webinar, and I'm glad that uh, we are joined by so many beautiful alumni led by our dear Professor Evelyn Sonko, the president of the Alumni Association, with, with many other guests that we have. We will be joined by three Thomasians to serve as speakers, uh, representing the health social sciences, the natural sciences, the technology sciences, and also the humanities in the social sciences. So watch out. Uh, Magsasama-sama po tayo ngayong araw, learning a lot of things uh, about uh, the academe alumni industry and government collaboration. I would like to thank uh, foremost our sponsors for this summit, Globe Telecoms, uh, CBRC, uh, uh, Carl Balita Review Center, VICE, Radius Telecoms, and the Metro Rail Transit Corporation. You must be wondering why we are here in this virtual setup. Well, in 2009, in 2019, uh, um, in February of 2019, uh, the first international summit for AAIG uh, was uh, uh, conducted uh, in Meralco, somewhere there, uh, so Meralco. Uh, this, is, uh, this is a beautiful uh, collaboration. Uh, amongst four sectors. So we have the academe, alumni, industry, and government. And so the challenge to understand the role and the relationship and partnership amongst these four sectors has become more apparent as we face the pandemic since 2020. Magdadalawang taon na po, pero we do not stop learning and relearning things so that we could journey on how to face the future in the next few years. So let me, uh, let us begin uh, by asking God help for this webinar, which will be followed by the national anthem. So it is my, my honor to call Monsignor Bernardo Pantin, the president of the UST Alumni Priest Association for the invocation, which will be followed by our national anthem. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Heavenly Father, we praise and thank you for this gathering of the members of the academe, alumni, industry, and the government in order to hold meaningful conversations that will benefit the alumni of the university and all other graduates in whose hands the future of our country rests. Grant us the grace to be open and to collaborate with one another so that together we can find meaningful solutions and strategies to make our graduates ready contributors to the growth of our nation. During this time of the pandemic, where many are suffering, where many businesses have closed and many are out of work, give us the courage and strength to face these challenges. May we not succumb to despair and discouragement in the midst of difficulties, but rather see windows of opportunities that are being opened for us. As we pray for our graduates, especially those who are in search of jobs, we also pray for ourselves that we become true servants in service to our fellow alumni, especially those that have just graduated. May everything we do Read down to the glory of your name. This we ask through Christ our Lord. Amen. St. Thomas Aquinas, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Sorry. 
Magandang umaga sa ating lahat virtual world. We might be in virtual reality right now, but we are joined by more than 300 participants, alumni, students from the academe, from the industry, uh, and from the government sector. We are gathered together because we are having a summit. It's called the uh, Academe Alumni Industry and Government uh, Summit. 2021 sponsored by the USD Alumni Association Incorporated in partnership with the USC Graduate School Center for Continuing Professional Education and Development. We call that USD GSCC PED. Uh, pinagsasama-sama po natin ngayon at pag-uusap-usap po ngayong umaga ang sektor ng gobyerno, sektor ng corporate world, uh, sector ng industriya at ng academe upang pag-usapan po natin ang particular topic for this first uh, webinar for this summit. It's entitled Transitioning the Graduates to Industry 4.0 Workplace. You must be wondering, ano ba yung Industry 4.0 Workplace, right? Or, will we transition from employ uh, education to employment, from school to work? But what do educational institutions like UST and the rest of the higher educational institutions have to do, ano bang dapat natin gawin to prepare the workforce for Industry 4.0, especially that we are now in the midst of pandemic. Ladies and gentlemen, I am so happy to introduce to you, to welcome us to this program, someone who has journeyed with us simula pa nung pandemia. Sana hindi pa po siya pagod, right? <laughs> she will be welcoming us in this event, the Vice Rector for Academic Affairs, University of Santo Tomas, leader ng UST natin ngayon sa field ng academic affairs. Let us all welcome Dr. Cheryl Ramos Peralta. Thank you, Dr. Lawrence. <laughs> Professor Dr. Evelyn A. Songko. President of the USC Alumni Association Incorporated, Associate Professor Jocelyn F. of the Willie, Director of the Center for Continuing Professional Education of the USC Graduate School, Mr. Henry S. Tenedero, Convener of the AAIG 2021 and Chairman of the USC AAI, our distinguished panel of resource persons, especially Honorable Commissioner Dr. Alvin A. Darilag of the Commission on Higher Education, our dear alumni, guests, students, and other participants, a pleasant morning and welcome to AAIG Summit 2021. On behalf of our beloved rector, very reverend father, Richard G. Ang O.P., I congratulate the USD Alumni Association Incorporated and the USD Graduate School Center for Continuing Professional Education for this very successful and timely undertaking, the AAIG Summit 2021, with the theme, National Multisectoral Summit for Educational Transformation and Academe Alumni Industry Government Collaboration. The University of Santo Tomas is one with you in this worthwhile activity and we are very proud of our alumni's initiatives in spearheading a collaborative approach to addressing the challenges of a volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous or VOCA world. The University of Santo Tomas continues to dedicate itself to the formation of competent and compassionate professionals committed to the service of the church, the nation, and the global community. In its 409 years of delivering quality Catholic education, UST has produced thousands of alumni leaders who shape the future of society. In the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic, a great number of Tomasians served the country and the world in various capacities and industries helping us overcome the unprecedented disruptions of our current time. In the month of August 2021, the University of Santo Tomas had the privilege of participating in the technical working group convened by the Senate of the Philippines 
to draft an act to create a second Congressional Commission on Education to assess and evaluate the state of Philippine education and recommend innovative and targeted reforms in education, otherwise known as EDCOM II. The technical working group was convened by the Senate Committee on Basic Education, Arts and Culture under Honorable Senator Winge Chalian, joined with the Senate Committee on Higher, Technical, and Vocational Education, headed by a fellow alumnus, Honorable Senator Joel Villanueva, was very instrumental to our inclusion as a member of the TWG. The TWG was participated in by policymakers and key players in Philippine education, including the Department of Education, the Technical Education and Skills Development Authority, and the Commission on Higher Education. EDCOM II recognizes that there is a need for transformative, concrete, and targeted reforms in education, and the university is honored to be heard in this forum on behalf of its internal and external stakeholders, including the thousands of students and alumni that we serve every academic year. In its position paper to the Senate, USD raised its concerns about learning gaps identified among Filipino students in basic education based on international competency standards as reported by the Philippine Business for Education in 2021, which are expected to later cascade toward their capability to perform in higher education and subsequently meet the rigors of the future workplace. These gaps may be aggravated by learning losses brought about by school closures due to the COVID-19 pandemic, as reported by UNESCO, at all levels of education. The impact is expected to be greatest in basic education, but students in higher education may likewise suffer from learning losses due to the absence of opportunity for hands-on practice of skills needed for their future profession and the challenges of rendering adequate validation and assessment of the attainment of learning outcomes. These learning gaps and learning losses may reduce the capability of our graduates in higher education to fulfill workplace expectations, potentially contributing to slow school-to-work transitions and future unemployment or underemployment as has been reported by PBED. Given the shrinking half-life of knowledge as published by Angel in 2013, in light of the rapidly changing needs of society and Industry 4.0, even in anticipation of Industry 5.0 as has been recently published by some literature, these learning gaps shall widen exponentially unless arrested in the soonest possible time. Addressing these learning gaps in higher levels of education or within the school-to-work transition will require additional resources that may not be available to all educational institutions or industries absorbing the products of our educational system unless adequate government support are made available to both public and private sectors. As it is, the COVID-19 pandemic continues to bring significant financial challenges to the private education sector and the economic sector, and government support is crucial to allow them to recover from the impact of this global crisis and help address the skills gap among our graduates. Thus, USD recommended that EDCOM 2 be undertaken as a multi-sectoral, multidisciplinary initiative involving legislative, education, and industry sectors, ensuring public and private representations to guarantee a comprehensive assessment of the current status of education at all levels, identify the evolving needs of all involved sectors, establish best practices, and develop potential strategies that may be undertaken to solve the current crisis in education. The AAIG Summit 2021 is a valuable step in this direction. 
This is indeed a great opportunity for feedback and continuing conversation for future engagements and to build a robust ecosystem where fast incubation and birth of innovative pathways lead to inclusive life success and national development. May we develop powerful partnerships that will not only prepare fresh graduates for the world of work, but likewise reskill and upskill current professionals to help them adapt to the rapidly changing demands of the workplace. With connection and collaboration, may we address this VUCA world with a VUCA solution, as stated by Bob Johansen. Vision, understanding, clarity, and adaptability with agility. Let us create a vision of our preferred future. Understand connections by listening to our stakeholders. Clearly and quickly make sense of the details of the chaos around us and adapt quickly to adapt to apply solutions. We look forward to meaningful dialogues in this four-day AAIG Summit 2021. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Cheryl Peralta, our Vice Rector for Academic Affairs. Indeed, uh, ngayon pa lang nakikita na natin ang uh, partnership, the, the importance of partnership and the importance of listening to the stakeholders, you know, the transitional issues about from, from school to work, ano ba talaga nangyayari? Kaya meron tayong summit ngayon. Uh, kaya nga, I am so happy that uh, we will have the chance to understand what this summit is all about. We will be uh, uh, oriented to what this is uh, for by our director of the USC Graduate School Center for Continuing Professional Education and Development. To give us the summit overview, let us all welcome Associate Professor Jocelyn F. Agkawili. Professor Cheryl R. Pernarta, USD Vice Rector for Academic Affairs, our distinguished guests, Ched Commissioner Dr. Aldrin A. Darilag, Mr. Rolando J. Paulino, Jr. of Shell Philippines Exploration, and Mr. Jeffrey Tarayao of Juan Meralco Foundation, Professor Evelyn Sonko, President of the U UST Alumni Association, Dean Henry Tenedero, Chairman of the Board of Trustees of the UST Alumni Association, Dear colleagues, friends, a pleasant day to everyone. This National Multisectoral Summit for Educational Transformation, an Academe Alumni Industry Government Collaboration, or AAIG 2021, is a sequel to the National Summit of Alumni, Academe, Industry, and Government, forging strategic alliances for inclusive Success or AAIG 2019, which was held in January 24 to 26, 2019. It can be said that this AAIG 2021 is a fulfillment of the manifestation of solidarity forged at that time. AAIG 2019 started the conversations among these social institutions to identify issues and concerns of the young alumni as they transition to the world of work, identify the causes of these issues and concerns, and to bring to the fore the possibilities of alliances that can foster conversations and innovative pathways to inclusive and sustainable development for the young alumni and the country. And indeed, AAIG 2019 was able to catalyze change by enjoining the industry and business leaders to envision novel and collective ways of bridging the academe and industry gap, spark strategic alliances and partnerships among the academe, alumni, 
industry and government sectors toward inclusive growth and success and provide a venue for responding together to the imperatives of local and global employment challenges to build a better tomorrow for our citizens. So now with AAIG 2021, as promised in the manifestation of solidarity of AAIG 2019, that there will be a regular staging of an AAIG summit every other year. Despite all odds and challenges brought about by this pandemic, the UST Alumni Association Incorporated now in partnership with the UST Graduate School Center for Continuing Professional Education and Development once again embarks in this webinar series to be able to create synergies, achieve successes and drum up widening awareness and interests to its mission of further strengthening the call for leaders in the government agencies, particularly the Commission on Higher Education, Department of Education, Technical Education and Skills Development Authority, the Department of Labor and Employment, and the basic and tertiary education institutions, and the industry to continue the conversations to forge a common innovative pathway to inclusive and sustainable life success for the alumni and towards the development for our country. The main objective of this AAIG 2021 webinar series is to catalyze the transformation of the Philippine educational landscape towards Education 4.0 by enjoining the academe, alumni, industry, and government sectors to come together in dialogue to adopt pioneering and collaborative practices in bringing the academe and industry gap and to continue to be an efficient and sustainable platform for feedbacks and continuing conversations for future engagements and to build a robust ecosystem where fast incubation and birth of groundbreaking pathways leading to inclusive life success and national development through re redefinition of the roles of learning institutions to nurture new ways of academic thinking, which may in turn facilitate new ways of learning across various academic disciplines. The webinar series will be held on the following dates, starting today, September 3, with a theme, Transitioning Graduates to the Industry 4.0 Workplace, where we will attempt to answer the question, what do educational institutions have to do to prepare the workplace for Industry 4.0? And on September 17, uh, the theme is Industry 4.0, Disruptions, Disturbances, and Disorders, where we will try to identify the challenges that Industry 4.0 brings to higher education. On October 1, our theme will be Higher Education in the Industry 4.0 Era, where we will try to envision what each sector has to do to catalyze the transformation of Philippine educational landscape towards Education 4.0. And last but not the least, on October 15, towards a robust ecosystem for transformative education will be the theme. And for, he, for this, we will once again forge a new manifestation of solidarity to ensure the continuity and sustainability of our AAIG mission. So although each webinar is, a, is complete in itself, surely we will be able to pick up nuggets from each. We request everyone to join us in all the four webinars and to be one with the University of Santo Tomas and the UST Alumni Association in embracing and pushing forward this advocacy 
for educational transformation to truly bridge the gap between academe and industry so that together we may take action on the imperatives of local and global employment challenges to build a better future for our citizens and for our beloved country. May this morning be a fruitful learning experience for all of us. Good morning. Thank you so much, uh, Associate Professor Jocelyn Agkawili. Uh, listening to uh, uh, Dr. Jo, uh, uh, it's an invite for us to continuously reflect about what's happening with our world today. For those who are just tuning in, you are here with us sa ating AIIG Summit 2021. Uh, we are inviting you, everyone. We are about 400 in the Zoom uh, space, but more sa Facebook Live. So we are, kung pag nakita nyo po yung, yung, ano namin, yung Facebook link namin, uh, pa, kindly share lang po para mas may marami pa tayong mga iba't ibang mga alumni, students, and everyone who is interested in our topic, transitioning the graduates to industry 4.0 workplace so that they could join us. But before we get into uh, the webinar itself, let me first explain uh, some few items so you would know how to participate in this event. One, uh, your microphone is turned off throughout the duration of this webinar, but you will have the opportunity to submit questions to today's presenter by typing your name and questions into the Q&A chat box. That is especially for those who are with us in the Zoom and also in our Facebook Live. You may specify your name of the speaker to which question will be addressed to. Otherwise, the question will be addressed to all. You may also send your questions anytime during the presentation and someone will collect these and address this during the open forum uh, where I will be also your moderator. Uh, if you are experiencing technical issues or difficulties, you may notify the secretariat by typing the, in the chat box. For any general questions not related to webinar, current webinar also, kasi baka gusto nyo pong umaten sa mga susunod pa mga webinars, uh, and all other things, the secretariat will get in touch with you via your email address. So just, just leave your email address in the chat box and everything will be good. Uh, I know you want to have more engagement with our uh, alumni association, uh, with our continuing education, uh, and all other friends that you probably will uh, discover along the way dito sa ating chat box. So please do so, inform our secretariat uh, to, and get in touch via email address. So I really hope that everybody will uh, remain until the very end. Uh, kasi after this uh, three presentations, uh, we will have an open forum for announcements. And we will have more announcements on what will happen in the next few uh, webinars that we're going to have as part of this summit. So I guess we are all prepared now to listen to our first speaker. And I have the honor to introduce our first speaker, whose name is Rolando J. Paulino Jr. Don, the engineer Don, has more than 25 years of international senior leadership experience in the energy and have worked in various sites in the United Kingdom, Malaysia, Australia, and the Philippines. So he led large production and manufacturing facilities, including those that supply more than 25% of energy of a country needs with passion, integrity, and care for people. He has been recognized. Uh, uh, and you know some of these recognitions uh, were 2017 Gawad Pio Valenzuela Award given by the city of Valenzuela and Pio Valenzuela Foundation. A 2017 Outstanding Alumni, fellow Thomasia natin siya, uh, of the Faculty of Engineering, and 2020 Gold Stevie Award for Innovative Management in Energy. Dawn has a degree, graduated cum laude, mechanical engineering, degree in mechanical engineering from the University of Santo Tomas, and he has a master's in business administration, an MBA, uh, from the Ateneo de Manila University 
and he has been part of the Shell's business leadership program for many years. So when not working, he is busy with his personal projects on renewable energy and technology, photography, cycling, and in coaching future leaders. So there is a friend in Don here, right? So listen to him. Ladies and gentlemen, fellow of the Institute of Corporate Directors, a fellow of Asian Academy of Engineering and Technology, president of the Philippine Energy Independence Council and a managing director of Shell Philippines Exploration, let us all welcome engineer Rolando J. Paulino Jr. Welcome, Paul, engineer. Thank you very much, uh, Clarence. Yeah. And uh, thank, thank you for the very warm uh, introduction in, in and welcome. Um, and I just want to also take this opportunity for, for uh, with the AEIG for giving me another shot uh, in, in presenting uh, in this uh, conference. Let me just check if I can share my screen now um, and um, kick things off uh, with you. Okay. Okay. There. okay can you uh, clearly see the screen now? I'll put on my power. Yeah. So good morning, um, everybody. And uh, for those who are not in the Philippines right now and listening uh, in our uh, global economy right now, so good afternoon or good evening, uh, where, where, wherever you are. So what I would like to share with you today is really about the passion that we have. And, 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 and for, for, for me, what, I, what have shaped me in the last 27 years uh, working for um, an, an industrial company is really the fact that in a lot of the changes that we all have to undergo through, there's one thing that remains constant. And that is really about understanding the passion that, that we have and in being passionate on certain subjects. And what is more important for me, despite of all those changes that has happened is actually understanding what fundamentally is behind those subjects. So that's what I would like the, the, the journey to, to, to bring uh, with you. And, and that, 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 that the, my, my background has shaped me a lot. Uh, I've been teaching with the USD now for the last six months uh, and, and at the same time with, with the De La Salle University. So I can say I'm a young educator uh, for, for in, in, in the meantime, but, but also I have a 21 year old Matthew uh, who is actually a third year materials engineering student uh, right now. And I think that experiences that, that I had had led me to two things. And, and that is really about creating and making dreams possible. And that our success is not just about ourselves, but it's really about making others successful. So as we go through this presentation, think about those two things because as educators, as students, as leaders of uh, this, um, of the, and, and leaders in the academy, we have a role to play in, in all of that. Now, people have been talking about Industry 4.0. And maybe as the first presentation, I would just like to ground everybody what Industry 4.0 really means and what it is. And let me tell you a story. Uh, when I was young, um, we have a small business. My mom will ask me or my dad will ask me to, uh, to support them in that business. And, and one of the things that I will need to do is to buy materials for, for, for that business or even collect the money for people who owe us. Whenever my mom will ask me to do that, she will give me a sketch of where that company is or where that person is and how to actually get there. And that sketch has been my guide to, to actually reach that, that place. And for, for me, if you compared it with um, the journey that we're being here, be, being right now, that sketch is equivalent to more or less industry 1.0. It's basic, fundamental, this is the map, this is where, where, where you're going through. And after that, uh, things have been uh, a bit more uh, advanced and I started getting maps of um, Manila uh, uh, as I grew older uh, and as a student of, of USD. And then eventually, as I joined the industry, GPS started coming in. And that's what Industry 3.0 is all about. So you have the GPS in your car nowadays that actually tells you that I'm going to a certain location 
that's where I'm going to. And this is the path that you can take. Now, the thing with GPS is that it has a single algorithm. It will ask you uh, the fastest or it will ask you whether you want the fastest or the shortest uh, distance. But lately, if you look at it, those, especially the pre-COVID period when the traffic of Manila was just unbearable and going to work takes you three hours, a lot of us have actually started using Waze. And what Waze does is that it gives you the pathway of where um, um, the location that you want to be or the destination you want to be. But at the same time, it tells you the most efficient path to do that, to, go, to get there. And how does it do it? It actually uses the information of the crowd, the people traveling, the speed in a certain street, and collate that and turn it to something intelligent and say, look, if you use this road, this will be faster based on the analysis that we have. And I guess that's the reality of our world nowadays. It's about the interconnectedness. It's about the data that we actually have and use on a daily basis to actually make efficient, uh, reliable decisions on the things we want to. The example I gave to you was a very simple example that we do on a day-to-day -day life. It's about where to go and how technology can actually help. If you expand that, in a much wider sense in a business. We now have technology that actually enables us to predict failure. In the work that I do, we actually collect tons of data, but the most, the beauty of those data now is we can put it on an algorithm and tells us this particular equipment can will actually fail if you don't do anything because of the trends that we have. And that's also the reason why with Malampaya, um, the energy coming from Malampaya, we can supply it at a very high reliability of 99.9% because of the data that we have and because of um, how we use that internet uh, to actually help us make better decisions. So that's the journey that we had in the world from that simple sketch that my mom gave me so the fact now that we can actually use ways and ways telling us how the, be how the best path to, to actually go, go to a certain destination. And I'm sure there's a lot of examples that you can now start thinking about how Industry 4.0 and the use of data in the internet is actually helping you to actually make better decisions, more reliable decisions, and at the same time, set a path for yourself. Now, I've been reflecting on this, and, and interestingly, I got this book back in 2008. So, so one of the things that I do whenever in, I'm, I'm in a country is I will go to the old bookstore shops, uh, the secondhand bookstore. And um, being a nerd and being an engineer myself, I, I, I want some, some old books on engineering. And I came across this. Um, it's the engineering in the Asian world and the Asian culture and society. And if you just look on the contents, um, and this book was, um, it, it's in the early 90s that this was written. Uh, sorry, er, early 1910s. Um, and, and if you look at it, the issues that they are dealing with, not just in the Asian world, but, but even in the, the time this book was written, it's almost the same things that we're actually dealing with right now. Power, energy, I mean, World War II was because of Japan's search for better and, and sustainable energy for their country. I mean, water supply it continues to be an issue uh, for, for, for us. I mean, just last year, right, uh, we had the, the issue on having low water pressure and, and that our dams going down. And I think in, in, in all of these things, uh, engineering continue to play a very important part. Right, and, and, um, and these things has not changed. And so the question that I have myself is, if these needs are not changing, what is changing with Industry 4.0? And I have two authors with you to share some thoughts in that. And one is um, Michael Sandel, 
uh, who wrote a number of books on justice and tyranny of merit. Uh, and his in latest books, he said, in the new economic order, the notion of work tied to a lifelong career is over. What matters now are innovation, flexibility, entrepreneurialism, and a constant willingness to learn new skills. Yuval Harari also said in his uh, book, 21 Lessons from the 21st Century, he said, in the 21st century, we're flooded by enormous amount of information. We're talking about beyond ways here, right? People need the ability to make sense of this information, to tell the difference between what is important, what is unimportant, and above all, combine many bits of information into a broad picture of the world. And in order for us to keep up with the world of 2050, you will need not merely new ideas and products, but above all, to reinvent yourself again and again and again. Which actually made me reflect that what remains constant is really about understanding the fundamentals. Because for you to learn new skills and be able to adapt and to be able to make sense of all this information that we have, you need to have a very fundamental understanding of subjects that you're really passionate about. Just think about it as a doctor. A doctor with the help of new MRI technology, with the help of uh, other technology where they can actually go inside the body, they still need to step back and analyze what am I actually doing here? What am I trying to do with this person? And I, in, by doing this, and I'm, am I curing him or her? And I'm, am I promoting wellness? And a lot of these things, if you look at it, whilst artificial intelligence and machine learning can actually help us analyze it, there's still one thing that artificial or machine learning cannot actually have. And that's the ability to have an emotion. And that's the ability to have empathy uh, with, with others. And this is a very important skill that a doctor, a dentist, a nurse, an engineer, a leader in the industry needs to have. Aside from all this information where certain equipment and tools can help you, if you look at it, empathy and the emotions around it, it's not something that AI can do. And that pretty much is actually grounding us to really understand what the technology and what, what do we really need moving forward. I want to share with you just a graph of um, how I see careers of people and how I see the career that I had for, for, for myself and as an engineer. Now, when I started my, my engineering degree at USD, definitely there was an increase in my technical skills. I learned to understand the beauty of thermodynamics. I learned to understand why stresses are both important and dangerous to, to our equipment and to the design that we have. I learned to understand that behind this uh, technology and the, 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 tech, the technical things that I'm doing, I'm also doing it for something bigger. And that's really being part of an organization and being part of something that actually help others to, to, to become successful. And I think we all go through this path that from, from doing our degree, we, we, we learn a lot. And then as we go along, the need for that technical understanding becomes less and less. Now, I want to emphasize on this area of that graph because it is important that as we spend more time in leadership roles, in roles that actually makes a lot of impact and difference as doctorate researchers, as educators. What is more important is not the vast of knowledge that we continuously have. It is important to continue to develop ourselves, but it's what's more important is that we have the understanding of what's really important. And it could be the foundations of 
um, thermodynamics in, in, in my case. It could be the foundation of biology. And because a lot of these things doesn't change through time. Because by understanding that fundamental, it enables us to think more clearly so we can actually influence more what can happen in the future. And I would like to close with this in a challenge that I put into this summit. If you go back to my first slide about that journey from Industry 1.0 to Industry 4.0, it is important to understand that. But for, for me, it's not about waiting for the future to happen. For me, what is more fundamental is actually being able to do the things we want to do now and start influencing the journey that we have. And there are three things that we can do together, not just in this summit, in the classroom, but, but also in the offices that we're in. The first one really is about falling in love with the subjects that we're passionate about. We don't need to fall in love with the same subjects. We just have to fall in love in the things that we really want. Because falling in love in those subjects allows us to contribute and be complementing one another. It is important that in, under, in falling in love with those subjects, we also understand the fundamentals around it. The second thing that we can do is really about communicating, engaging, and actively participating in the discourse, especially nowadays. I think the information that we get, as Yuval Harari says, is just enormous. And it is important that we be able to focus that, 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 that information and be able to process that discussion in something that is tangible for us, for us to make sense and allow us to use that information to adapt to new skills. And maybe last point really is, whilst we continue to be a world of commerce, whilst money continue to, 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 to be important uh, in the decisions and the, the work that we do, we're doing, it is important that leadership skills of empathy, listening, finding your own purpose, communicating, and collaboration continue to be an important and fundamental part of the education system that we have, but also a very important part of the society that we continue to live in. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Maraming maraming salamat, Engineer Don, uh, for that very inspiring sharing. Um, grabe, una pa lang ito, no? And then, do, do keep interacting uh, over our chat box uh, as we are expecting you to write down your questions for each speaker. And later, we will try uh, as much as possible to respond to these questions. No? We will collect them and address them during the open forum. So for the first speaker, wow, uh, nakikita niyo po natin ng isang engineer, right? Uh, who had about 27 years of, um, of practice learning about the basics and I think arguing about really having a passion for what is fundamental. So, dapat malaman at paintindihan natin, but do not just stop there. As an engineer, it's really fascinating to, to listen to someone who knows that key to all these technologies are actually humanity. He calls it empathy. So later, I am going to uh, probe more about this uh, 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 dynamics and let's see uh, uh, what really how, what is it that we from the academe should be doing in order to be true prepared for industry 0.40? So I think we're ready for our second speaker. So uh, our second speaker is also a fellow Thamashian. Uh, he has 20 years experience in managing corporate social responsibility, corporate foundations, community relations, sustainability strategy and reporting, 
and communications. So he has this extensive experience in developing strategies for creating shared value programs, corporate community partnership and sustainable development strategies. We are lucky because he found time to be with us. Sarabi po ng kanyang engagement, not only here, but also even in other countries. Uh, in Meralco, uh, where he is the president, Mar Meralco Foundation, he led the transformation of the company's corporate social responsibility program from grant given to a more strategic approach. He has received so many awards like CHR Leadership Challenge, Philippine CSR Leadership Challenge, the Asian CSR Award, Global CSR Awards, the International Gold Quill in New York, Corporate Governance Asia's Best CSR Award. Oh, medyo madami po ito. But, and, but the more important part is his, real, his intention to sharing his knowledge and practice of CSR, sustainability, and sustainable development goals uh, sa United States of America, sa United Kingdom, Netherlands, Australia, New Zealand, India, China, Malaysia, Singapore, and Hong Kong to name a few. So Jeff, as we call him, uh, uh, was chosen as one of the Asia 21 Fellows of the Asia Society, a group of emerging leaders of Asia below 40. So, ang atin pong guest ngayon obtained his undergraduate studies, uh, cum laude, syempre, from the University of Santo Tomas, Manila, Philippines, but also finished his Master's of Sustainable Development degree from the Faculty of Science and Engineering of Macquarie University in Sydney in 2018 as an Australia Awards Scholar. So, lecturer din po siya ng Corporate Social Responsibility and Good Governance in the College of Commerce and Business Administration of the University of Santo Tomas. Uh, a true-blooded Tomasian, I suppose. <laughs> he has been helping many of us uh, in the university. Ladies and gentlemen, let us welcome the president of One Miralco Foundation, Mr. Jeffrey Ochoa Tarayao. Jeff? Good, good morning to all of you. Uh, it's nice to hear yung palakpak, no? Very few <laughs> Zoom activities would have that. Uh, let me just share my, my screen. Uh, there you go. Can you see my screen now? Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. Yes, thank you. Uh, good morning, friends, and thank you for spending your TGIF morning with us. Uh, my personal thanks to the UST Alumni Association for having me today. I think the earlier presentation of Don uh, has really painted the scenario that our graduates face in the light of Industry 4.0, uh, particularly its workplace. So let me add some more thoughts, particularly what educational institutions can do. In most occasions, universities, not only to prepare our graduates, but also transform the learning experience that may endure subsequent industrial revolutions in society. Because earlier this year, there were talks of Industry 5.0 already. No? So we already heard how technological progress is enabling machines to compete or to complete many of the tasks that once required human beings. Nearly every job will change, many quite profoundly, and the overwhelming majority of today's employees will need to develop new skills. Thus, universities will play an important role in nurturing high-skill talent the country needs for sustainable economic growth. However, the automation revolution has been accelerated by COVID-19. Companies are emerging from the crisis into a workplace of physical distancing and major changes in customer behaviors and preferences. Before COVID-19, the largest disruptions to work involved new technologies and growing trade links. COVID-19 has, for the first time, elevated the importance of the physical dimension of work. It has propelled faster adoption of automation and AI, or artificial intelligence, especially in work arenas with high physical proximity. And recovery is forcing organizations to reimagine their operations 
adapting to digitally driven operations and customer journeys. Let me share with you some thoughts from the McKinsey Global Institute. COVID-19 has reshaped the world in ways that will endure long after the pandemic Recording ends. In progress. Remote work is here to stay. E-commerce is soaring. Automation is accelerating. Our research indicates that the mix of available jobs will change as a result, creating more urgency for training workers for the changes ahead. More than 100 million workers in our focus countries, or one in 16, may need to switch occupations by 2030. Job growth will be more heavily concentrated in high-skill jobs, while middle and low-skill jobs decline. The explosion in e-commerce set off a scramble for warehouse workers that is unlikely to stop. Investment in the green economy will increase the need for wind turbine technicians. Demand for photographers may grow to address our increasingly visual ways of communicating. Aging populations in many advanced economies will increase demand for nurses, home health aides and hearing aid technicians. Teachers and training instructors will also continue to find work over the coming decade. But the forces unleashed by COVID-19 have put other jobs at risk. Business travel is unlikely to recover quickly and that affects flight attendants, airline mechanics and baggage handlers. Use of self-checkout stands accelerated during the pandemic, displacing some grocery store clerks. Companies have deployed robotics to process routine paperwork, replacing office workers. We are entering an era of occupational transitions, an era that demands answers to three key questions. What new approaches to training can support the millions of people making these transitions? To protect the social fabric, what benefits, such as sick leave and unemployment insurance, are needed for all workers, including gig workers? Can business and government leaders come together to create solutions, not only for navigating the pandemic, but for navigating the post-pandemic world of work? So I, I, I think the pivotal reality is that those changes will have significant effects on the requirements for uh, um, workforce skills no? and capabilities, particularly in two types, in which this is upskilling, in which staff gain new skills to help in their current ro roles, and reskilling, in which staff need the capabilities to take on different or entirely new roles. Companies will need people with the right skills to develop, manage, and maintain their automated equipment and digital processes and to do the jobs that machines cannot. When I was in HR or working in HR 20 years ago and doing organizational development, the most common term we hear was right sizing. Today, the operative term is right skilling. The right skilling can actually start earlier, earlier on in um, the university. Of course, through probably the development of Education 4.0, designed for the learner 4.0. But this may also be achieved by maximizing the ecosystem where educational institutions belong to transform into an innovation-based and futures thinking-based educational institution. Therefore, a shared value relationship between educational institution and companies, blueprinted probably by policymakers, can help facilitate workforce transitions. Universities must exhibit extraordinary flexibility and adaptability in responding to this reality with purpose and innovation. That point to more inclusive future of work. Let me offer a number of solutions. First, enhance the campus experience by expanding their di digital infrastructure and infrastructure. I think the fundamental, uh, or I think fundamental to this preparation is expanding and enhancing the digital infrastructure in the learning space, including those who are studying remotely. Digital skills must be built in 
Institutions should have modern workplace skills and focus on training their faculty to build digital skills to develop fully able students for the workplace. Improving students' cognitive learning abilities are enabled by adapting technological applications. And while doing this, soft skills should be made indispensable with a mix of problem-solving problem solving social skills and process skills. Inherent to this transformation is digital integrations, ensuring system interoperability, scalability, uh, extensibility, as well as data integrity, security standards, and governance across multiple applications and platforms in schools or university processes. This environment prepares our students to an integrated digital life. I know some companies that are shifting towards integrations and they are moving to hiring more solution integration developers rather than application specific developers. To institutionalize this transformation, an educational institution might want to consider appointing a chief innovation officer. Second, constantly update the skills development agenda with a clear strategy for STEM education. We have to remodel the curriculum with an emphasis on STEM and futuristic subjects. Employers are challenged with a short pipeline of STEM skilled workforce and bank on educational institutions to prepare the future workforce or sometimes even upskill the present workforce. Tiger economies such as China, Malaysia, India, and Singapore in a quest to build their economies focused on offering STEM programs in their institutions. And so we must identify and correct long-standing imbalances in the educational systems and make up for long delays in developing science and technology capabilities. More than increasing the number of STEM-based workforce, STEM plays a crucial role in our ongoing quest for sustainable development. Third, expand the ecosystem of learning by co-locating programs with corporations or probably tie up with corporate universities. I believe now more than ever, smart and strategic industry and academic partnerships must be more integrated and value enhancing to both. While philanthropic donations are still needed, shared value programs must also be high in the agenda. Some programs include shared laboratories for innovation and incubation, encouraging innovation competitions, field projects, applied research, action research, faculty employee exchange programs, and aligning learning enrichment programs for both students and faculty with corporate universities. Beyond engaging the alumni for philanthropy, engage them to expand the ecosystem of learning through impactful business partners, partnerships, research, impact investing, and incubation. Finally, we have to transform the campus as a hub, not only for learning best practices, but the staging platform for next practices. Uh, I think universities are not only suppliers of talent for the workforce, but must be at the forefront of solving problems for industry and the community. A university must become a one-stop knowledge center for firms, industry associations, government agencies, and community organizations. And we must all help in developing intellectual capital in our educational institutions for continuous knowledge creation and transfer. Governments, for example, may provide incentives for educational institutions fostering innovation. We know that countries with highly developed blueprints of their national innovation ecosystem are able to adjust easily to the changes in the global economy, if not shaping these changes. In conclusion, if Education 4.0 is how we should help transition our students to Industry 4.0, then it must also be a purposeful transformation to the learning experience by emphasizing to students, faculty members, and school administrators to take on challenges head on. I think uh, this summit, uh, which we started in 2019, is an important down payment for that transition. And we thank the USD Alumni Association and its partners for underwriting that uh, down payment. The balance, and we all have roles to play, will be paid by experimenting together, sharing knowledge, welcoming new partners, and by harnessing the actions of the academic alumni industries and governments. 
While we have seen time and again in our country that a better appreciation of science, technology, and innovation is held back not by technical limitations, but rather by social inertia, sometimes through outdated regulations and institutional barriers. Schools, by design, are hubs for experimentation and pushing beyond the norms of the day. I continue to believe that when society doesn't know how to do something, schools are where you go to solve those problems. Thank you very much for the opportunity to share my ideas with you today, and good morning. Wow, thank you so much, Jeff. As always, uh, it's uh, lovely um, listening to you. No? <laughs> uh, I, I, I am always fascinated whenever Jeff shares uh, his story. But for now, what I would love is to pick up the last point where, yes, itong AAIG natin na summit, it's really giving us, you know, down payment, no? Pero encouraging each and every one of us, I think yung the innovative argument ni Jeff, we will have to pay the balance too, right? Uh, to do our part. And later, I'm going to ask Jeff about that more, kung paano kaya natin ito magagawa given the limited resources that we have. Although, meron tayong mga creativity and UST has an innovation hub now. We have an office for innovation and we have a building for innovation. So maybe later we can talk about it, this on how we could better the uh, engagement with the alumni, with the, with, with the academe, with the industry, and with the government sector. So thank you so much, Jeff. And now I think we are good with, uh, uh, with uh, uh, the next speaker. Uh, he will be the last uh, for this uh, summit, and then we will have a forum. So please do not forget to send your questions uh, kasi ngayon po, uh, uh, mag-uusap po tayo ng, ng open forum after the third speaker and that uh, do send your ano, do send your, your concerns to uh, if you have any uh, because we would like to really establish network and connection as we have more than 400 now <laughs> participants sa Zoom, right? Okay, so it is my honor again to introduce our third speaker. Uh, our third speaker... As he, we mentioned many times, he is a commissioner of the uh, Commission on Higher Education. Uh, he, be, but before that, uh, it is nice to, to note that uh, Commissioner Aldrin A. Davilag really encompassed many work over the number of years. He has served as a director for human resources management sa De La Salle, Philippines, head of HR Commission ng La Salle Network. He was vice president of academic services at St. Paul University, Surigao. He was dean of uh, graduate school of St. Paul University, Manila. Also was a vice president for research planning and extension services sa pamantasan lungsod ng uh, Marikina. Uh, also taught as associate professorial lecturer at De La Salle University, Manila, adjunct uh, faculty of the various private higher institutions like Holy Angel University, Far Eastern University, UST, and De La Salle College of St. Benil. Our next speaker is a he finished Doctor of Philosophy in Educational Leadership and Management and has earned a PhD unit in science education, major in biology, he has a master's of education major in school leadership at De La Salle University, Manila. Siya rin po ay natapos at fellow Thomasia natin. He has a master's degree in medical technology at the University of Santo Tomas. But talk about certification. We will be listening to someone who knows what he will be talking about because he is a certified human resource professional. <laughs> he is a registered medical technologist and a registered nurse. So in the Commission on Higher Education, I am pleased to, to really read about his extensive and progressive work leading to the advancement of a wide array of relevant and timely disciplines in higher education. This is exemplified through his work as the Oversight Commissioner for Teacher Education and Teacher Quality, 
gender and development extension programs for state universities and colleges, and Southeast Asian Regional Center for Tropical Biology or Semeria Biotrop, and as a champion for futures thinking and cultural education. But on top of this, uh, 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 this is the most important part, I suppose, uh, the humanity of us, uh, of us all. Our commissioner, Darilag, maintains his primary role in life as a devoted family man and a loving husband to his wife, Maricel. Ladies and gentlemen, let us listen to our CHED Commissioner, Aldrin A. Darilag. Commissioner? We're just waiting for the commissioner. Okay. Dr. Aldrin? Dr. Aldrin, are you with us? So he has been uh, uh, working uh, many projects with the Commission on, 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 on Higher Education. In fact, uh, included uh, in his notable achievements in the meantime are uh, uh, he, he is in the time of COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, he's spearheading the Eastern Visayas Higher Education Institution Flexible Learning Management System Consortium in Region 8, leading the working on resilience and innovation for science and technology. So uh, um, also itong teaching, ano? teaching uh, and excellence in Region uh, uh, 11 and organizing a region-wide flexible learning initiatives and consortium programs of the 170 higher education institutions of Region 5 in partnership with the Bicol Foundation for Higher Education. And so um, uh, we're, we're, we're waiting for, uh, for uh, ating, ano, ang ating uh, 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 Commissioner uh, Aldrin, Dr. Aldrin. Um, is he, uh, will the technical persons uh, uh, work? Okay, okay. So uh, I, I, got the, I got the news no? uh, that uh, we need, uh, we just have to proceed with some of the questions that, uh, that uh, uh, yeah, some of the questions uh, for this forum as we wait for Dr. Uh, Dr. Uh, Darilag, okay? So I am uh, interested at, um, uh, sana pwede ko ba ma-ask ma ma si Engineer Don and uh, Engineer Don and uh, Jeff, uh, Mr. Jeff, uh, to be, to join me. Hi, Jeff. <laughs> Hi, Engineer Don, right? Uh -oh. Okay, so how are you today? <laughs> how it's are you today? It's a very early Friday, you know, for a lecture. <laughs> I know, I know. Uh -oh. So both of you are teachers, and I will be asking the same thing kay, ano, kay uh, Dr. Uh, Aldrin later. But siguro, the ang, ang topic kasi natin talaga and which you, you were able to articulate very, very well. But I think I just would like to show and, and demonstrate some humanity here. Can you recall when you were a student? Uh, and my question would be, <laughs> how, how are you as a student during that time? And I think the most important part is during that time, how were you able to transition to work? Was it really the same as what many are experiencing right now? Yung transition to university to, em to employment, no? Marami ba kayo pinagdaanan? And what are your learnings uh, for that purpose, right? Oh. <laughs> yes, I I'll ask uh, uh, Engineer Don muna. Medyo kakabatch ka ba, ka ba, ka ba kita? <laughs> Uh, batch 94 ako, sir. Oh, pa pareho tayo ng generasyon. Batch 95 ako. Batch 95. Ah, okay. Yes, engineer. Hindi, hindi Masaya si Jeff kasi medyo bata siya. Okay. <laughs> yes, engineer. So, Don. Siguro with, with, with your question. So one, your question is, how was I as a student? And then mm -hmm. at the same time, what are the adjustments I have to make uh, moving, to, moving to the industry? So maybe the first question is, how was I? So the most significant thing that I remember when, when I was studying engineering was actually going to Recto. I'm not sure if those bookstores, the, the second half bookstores, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. are still there. And, and one of the things that I do there is carve through uh, bookstores and look for secondhand books um, because it's cheaper, but, but also I look for classical things. So, so, so one of the things that I bought there that really helped me in my engineering degree was this book on classical thermodynamics. Mm -hmm. And um, 
and, and I'm not sure if some of my professors are still here, surprisingly enough, when I bought that book, I didn't realize that my teachers were actually getting test questions from that. So, 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 so it, it, for, for me, because the, the diligence that I put in on that book was actually to answer the questions on that book and the problems on a daily basis. And then, as I've said, I was a nerd and I really want to understand the fundamentals of engineering. Now, how did that help me? How did that help me in, in transitioning? Now, the challenge with working, moving from the university to actually going through the industry is twofold. One, the first one really is in the industry, you need to ask the question, you need to look for the problems, ask the question, and look for a solution. And that is totally different in, in the, the school, right? In, in school, especially in, in during my time, is we're given a problem and we're given the givens, and then you solve for the problem. Mm -hmm. In my case, when I moved to the university, um, into the, the industry, industry, I don't have the problem, but it is required for me to look for the problem. Otherwise, I don't have a job, right? Uh, and yeah. then in the process of looking for that problem, I need to solve that problem too for the business and for the organization. So that's that that for me is a big learning uh, and, and a challenge transitioning to that. The second part is really about engaging people. Because for you to look for a problem, solve a problem, and find a solution, you need to engage people. So in my case, as a young engineer, I will go to the control room of the refinery mm -hmm. and start talking with the panel operators. Mm -hmm. In Batangas, it's a, it's a different way to communicate to, uh, with this panel operator, which means because they're all experienced and, and have 30 years behind their belt, you have to communicate to them in a way that they understand it. Once you've done that, you now have to communicate to your supervisor. This is what I'm finding. And sometimes those are tenuous discussions. Uh -huh. uh, and, and eventually provide something that is structured and logical for the organization to actually adapt and do something. So those are the two things that I see different uh, whilst uh, being a student compared to, to going to the industry. Wow, uh, I like I, I like uh, Dodd, yung, ano, yung, 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 the, the two things that you just pointed out. No, that in, in life there are li really approaches. So there is approach in the school, but one should be ready that the approach in the real world will be different. But also, the more important part is the role of human beings, our relationships with human beings. No, uh, although, syempre kasi, pag sinabi mong engineer, you deal with machines, you deal with, uh, no. <laughs> that's not true. That's not true. That the, the, the best way to become the best engineer really is to be uh, human, right? <laughs> and to know the humanity of it all, right? And, and honestly, in, in solving a lot of these problems and being part of our organization, 80% of the time is I'm dealing with people. With people, right? And understanding what they're talking about, right? <laughs> uh, it, it's not about the machines. The machines are easy to understand. Mm -hmm. it, it, it's really about the dynamics and the relationship that you have. Because these are the people that will also help you solve these things. I, I love listening to you because I really think this should be and it should be embraced by the stem uh you know by the the science technology uh, engineering math and uh, a uh, paradigm right or natalagang mahalaga equally to have that human dimension uh in all the things that we are doing jeff what about you this is your field <laughs> how were you were you when you were a student parang hindi ko alam no <laughs> And it's not really my field, you know. I'm in communication arts, marketing, and advertising. And if I will connect to the idea of, of Don, no, uh, you know, when I was studying during my last year, uh, in a class of 40, dalawa lang sa klase namin ang, marun ang marunong mag Adobe Photoshop. Oh, yeah, yeah, Adobe Photoshop was very new at that there time. You we were an advertising uh, marketing uh, uh, student. Those specific skills of graphic design, layouting design are very crucial for you to pass. So we all struggled, no? Kasi out of 40, dalawa lang ang meron. At the end of the day, you will learn how to do it in school, the basics of it. When you move to, to work, it's going to be a different dimension. But I clearly remember what my mentor, the late Sir Bong Osorio, said. Mm -hmm. No matter how good you are with your Photoshop or your designing skills, 
it's the substance behind that. It, it's the consumer insight behind that graphic design, which will really make the difference. So at the end of the day, I think the mixture of uh, technological capabilities and the human insight are, are they're really needed. No? They're indispensable. They will always go together. It's a matter of how we're able to harness both of them correctly. Um, now, for transitioning, I think, um, and this is where I think the university has a really big role, mm -hmm. uh, particularly OSACs at that time. Yeah. You know, I always thought... This is I'm, the Office of Student Affairs and yes. Community Services. Oh. Nung time natin, OSACs pa. Oh. Ngayon, oh. Office of Student Affairs na lang. Correct. Oh. Uh, <laughs> the Kingdom of Mother Evelyn Songko. Yes. <laughs> uh, Our mama. <laughs> our mama. Um you know, I, 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 I really originally dreamt of doing something in broadcast or journalism uh, because that's what I like. Mm -hmm. you know, um, however, OSACs had a partnership with corporations at that time. And I was fortunate oh, okay. to be part of the second batch of the Ayala Young Leaders Program of, Ayala, of the Ayala Group. And, you know, when part of that partnership is that I go internship, I, 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 I underwent my internship in Ayala Corp. And... And during my third and fourth years, you, you the 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 hindi naman the dream, no, the vision for myself has practically changed. No? Uh -huh. It was earlier on I was exposed already. So okay. I think the ingredient of exposure, the opportunity for exposure to the real world, while you're in while you're still in school, is very crucial. Oh, after that, nagbago na ang career ko, di ba? <laughs> Actually, my first job in, 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 in the Ayala Group was in Globe, no? Okay, yes. Uh, and I was doing HR, uh -huh. very far away from what I, what I studied. No? Although, yeah. of course, the competencies were utilized. So the lesson there is that you have to blossom wherever you are planted. Blossom wherever you are planted. It led me to where I am today. Well, well, connected to that, uh, uh, Jeff, may question sa you dito, no? Uh, si uh, Mr. Ferdinand Salagan, no? Uh, and I think this has a lot to do with your, you know, yung, yung how you shift to your advocacy. Pero ang tanong niya kasi is, how do you envision other social institutions like government institutions, no? In reshaping their digital infrastructure transformation, if the national fails to consider innovations and technology and science as their primary advocacy. You see, I think I understand where he is coming from. The budget for research and development and innovation in the Philippines when it comes to governance is really small. Talagang mere fraction. Kaya yung innovation and yung research sa atin, talagang iyang palagi hinahap Inaano namin sa National Research Council and everyone. And I think the OST could feel that too, right? O yung, yung, but of course, pandemic. Everyone is, has this big problem on the budget. Na? So how do you envision? No? Meaning how, how do you envision other social institutions no? to reshape digital infrastructure, uh, especially in other uh, private sectors, I suppose? I think Don could also answer that question. Yes, yes, yes. yes. <laughs> infrastructure driven uh, industry but you know um based from my experience i think uh, it's all about openness to new technologies no and mm -hmm. understanding the role of it not only now but also in the future Tama. that's the reason why our lifestyle now is so digitally connected uh, you have the likes of uh, Manny Estrada here and uh, my colleagues in Globe before, Sir Manny Estrada and, uh, and I forgot the name of the lady no, who helped design this network, mm -hmm. this digital infrastructure. Can you imagine, no? Nung wala pang masyadong cell phones, uh -huh. uh, sila nag invest na because they're futures thinking. And uh -huh. I think that's a competency um, and a visionary skill that we should all have. Especially our leaders in organ, whether you're in government, whether in the acad in the academe, or in industries, no, that's the beginning of it. Now, the appetite for funding for it will come in later, because consumers will demand that you must evolve. Okay, oh, oh. Uh, engineer, yeah. uh, ano, ano pong karanasan niyo sa uh, you know that that digital infrastructure transformation experience, right? Oh, oh. Yeah. So, so maybe I'll just. Give, give a few data for, for, for people to, to touch on. I mean, if you read the news just a few days back, 
there was this news article about Globe. Yeah? Mm-hmm. And, and what we're saying is that Globe is going to invest around 70 billion pesos worth of capital expenditure in uh, 2022. And that is really just to expand their network. And I think that I, I can say the same for PLDT because there was another news article a couple of days back about the capital investment that, that, that the organizations are doing. So I think for, for, for me, we, with just those two data points, um, I, I think there is a digital the desire to put in the necessary infrastructure here in the Philippines to expand our, our um, digital capability. And if you look at it from a fintech, financial technology point of view, you have Gcash, you have Paymaya, you have ING that are starting to really actually starting to, to, to get in touch uh, with not just with people in Metro Manila, uh-huh. but people in the far-flung areas. Because mm-hmm. for, for me, technology needs to be very practical. We, we sometimes think about technology, as you, you mentioned earlier, about research, about innovation. For, for me, I think it should be the other way around. It should be, what are the practical uses that I can do now with what I have mm-hmm. and maximize the use of it? Once at the same time, developing what I need to do in the future. Because yeah. more often, companies will talk about digitalization, right? And they will yeah. talk about uh, algorithms, artificial intelligence, machine learning. No, they have their use and they have their value. But the question to that company is, have you actually maximized the use of Microsoft Word, PowerPoint, Mike OneNote in, in your company? Yeah. Right? And, 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 that, and, and sometimes the answer is no. I mean, even for me in my work, in the last two years, we have transformed our company to actually maximize the use of one note because we don't need to write minutes of meeting. It means that minutes are being written online and people can comment immediately on that. And people can easily access the data and the PowerPoint presentation using one note. That is a digital transformation using simple tools. Wow, I am I am so pleased that you mentioned one note. I am a practitioner of that too, and I have been encouraging my students. No, gamitin yung yung one note so we could share. We could, you know, we could we could simply lang shop. Kaya hindi kayo dapat matakot and everything. But I really think even yung Microsoft Word and all other basic uh, uh, basic programs, it's too much as a skill pero hindi natin siya ginagamit talaga. So, so mamaya pag-uusapan pa po natin uh, yung yung direction ng digital transformation and syempre yung issue natin tungkol sa transition from school to work. But now, pansamantala, we're going to listen to our uh, 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 to our next speaker, si Commissioner uh, Dr. Aldrin Marilag, right? O Adarilag, right? O uh, Dr. Aldrin uh, are you there now? Thank you so much, Dr. Jeff. Uh, Jeff and Engineer Don. Yeah, thank you. My congratulations to the University of Santo Tomas Alumni Association Incorporated for organizing for organizing this significant academic discourse entitled National Multisectoral Summit for Educational Transformation an academe alumni industry government collaboration. To the men and women of the Alumni Association Incorporated, my felicitations for this initiative and trailblazing effort of consolidating the parameters of the academe alumni industry and government to lay down on the discussion table all the necessary initiatives and interventions for a more sustainable growth and development in the education sector. It has been 538 days since the Philippines had a lockdown in response to COVID-19 pandemic. Since then, the country has reported around almost 2 million cases and almost 34,000 deaths. While we remain hopeful that COVID-19 will be eradicated soon, noting that almost 1.8 million cases have have recovered from the virus, It is certain that COVID-19 has disrupted and changed the landscape of the higher education. Quoting Professor Fernando Reimer's statement in the Global Education Innovation Initiatives of Harvard University, for educators, COVID-19 pandemic is a quintessential adaptive and transformative challenge 
one for which there is no pre-configured playbook that can guide appropriate responses. Education leaders must swiftly design responses and with specific context in mind as the pandemic runs its course. This call for educators to urgently adapt to the needs of our times and respond to multiple adaptive and transformative challenges necessary for the revitalization of the vital roles of government, academe, and industry to actively involve in the discussion and co-create systemic and long-term solutions. The multi-sectoral group should unite to work better during this time of crisis. COVID-19 continues to have a profound impact on the economic, political, and cultural landscapes of societies around the globe. Since COVID has prevented mobility, millions of Filipinos have lost their jobs, sacrificing their daily source of income, endangering the possibility of enrolling their children resulting to a significant decline in student enrollment, increased reports on school closures, and an unexpected faculty retrenchment. According to the UNESCO COVID-19 Educational Disruption and Response Task Force, through its global monitoring report, almost 1.2 billion young learners have been affected by school closures around the world. As to the particular statistics of our country during the pandemic, the report records that more than 28 million Filipino learners have been affected, with more than 3.5 million of those belonging to the higher education sector. To somehow mitigate the effect of COVID-19 to education and for learning continuity of children, countries around the world have been implementing remote education schemes. Yet, majority of the world's children, particularly those belonging to the poorer households, do not have the sufficient capabilities like internet access, connectivity, personal computers, television, and radio at home, amplifying at a great extent the effects of the so-called learning inequalities. Students who lack access to the technologies resorted to home-based learning as their last option to continue their education. As a consequence, many face the risk of never returning to school and doing years of progress made in education around the world. For better appreciation of everyone, let me present the following scenarios as per the data presented by UNICEF 2020. While more than 90% of the countries adopted digital and or broadcast remote learning policies, only 60% did, did so for pre-primary education. Policy measures taken by the governments to ensure learning continuity through broadcast or digital media allowed for potentially reaching 69% of school children at maximum in pre-primary to secondary education globally. 31% of school children worldwide, or 463 million, cannot be reached by the broadcast and internet-based remote learning policies, either due to the lack of necessary technological assets at home or because they were not targeted by the adopted policies. Online platforms were the most used means by the government to deliver education while schools remain closed, with 83% of countries using this method. However, this allowed for potentially reaching only about a quarter of school children worldwide. Television had the potential to reach the most students, 62% globally, only 16% of school children could be reached by radio-based learning worldwide. Globally, three out of four students who cannot be reached by the remote learning policies come from rural areas and or belong to the poorest households. 
both public and private higher education institutions had to adjust to the new situation where face-to-face -face interaction and mass gatherings are prohibited. Committed to their mandate, universities and colleges in the Philippines devised innovative ways to fulfill their trifocal functions of instruction, research, and community extension. Everyone adjusted to work from home arrangements, from the operations and support service units to the administrators and teachers. From the confines of their homes, distance from their students and physical resources available in schools, teachers and administrators were put to the task of revising and adapting course syllabi and requirements as they shifted to flexible learning modalities. Learning management systems were used by students and teachers who have access to electronic devices and reliable internet connections, while students who have limited access to computers or internet have relied on smartphones to exchange messages, notes, and materials through text messaging, email, and social media. To be specific, according to the Department of Information and Communications Technology and the Philippine Statistical Research and Training Institute, in their 2019 National ICT Household Survey, only about 18% of households have nationwide access to a stable internet connection, leaving 82% disconnected. The survey also revealed that there were more households who can have access to radio and television rather than Wi-Fi connected laptops. Indeed, it is through connectivity where people can attribute their level of accessibility to information and education in this time of health crisis. Amidst today's global context and ongoing battles against COVID-19, the world we live has truly changed. To provide all of you a glimpse of the scenario, let me share a brief update on the three crucial E's, education, employment, and economy. In a study of Pokrel and Shetri in the year 2021, this COVID-19 pandemic has created the largest disruption of the education system in human history affecting nearly 1.6 billion learners in more than 200 countries. Broadly identified challenges as the world transitions into alternative modes of teaching and learning includes issues on accessibility, affordability, flexibility, learning pedagogy, lifelong learning, and education policy. In terms of the prospects of the world economy, the UN Department of Education and Social Affairs, through its World Economic Situation and Prospects mid-2020 report, states that internationally, a 3.2% contraction is projected to hit the market. This would mean that $8.5 trillion will be lost as output over the next two years pushing 34 million people into extreme poverty. And with the last E, which is employment, the latest COVID-19 monitoring report of the International Labor Organization indicates that 94% of jobs equivalent to 2.7 billion workers are affected by lockdown measures with 25 million of those are currently under the threat of unemployment. Furthermore, the report highlighted that young workers are the major victims of socioeconomic consequences of this pandemic, as they are disproportionately impacted by multiple and simultaneously, simultaneous shocks, such as loss of jobs, disruption of training and education, and lack of new employment opportunities. Given these situations, the Commission has embarked on a series of proactive response measures that shall ensure that, that higher education learning continuity is realized amidst the time of pandemic. The Commission are constantly working with significant stakeholders to ensure 
that one's socioeconomic background should not be a deterrent factor to prevent students from an equitable quality education. To share quick wins about what we do in the Commission in line with this equitable education, we support our higher education campuses through the provision of a 3 billion peso budget to help them transform to smart campus in partnership with the DICT. CHED is determined to provide scholarship grants to children of overseas Filipino workers in partnership with DOLE. And lastly, our consistency in providing free higher education through the universal access to quality tertiary education in upholding RA10931. However, while we sustain the gains we have achieved recently, some universities had to suspend remote or online classes caused by severe natural calamities. For instance, due to Super Typhoon Rolly, some public universities have temporarily suspended all forms of academic classes secondary to the major catastrophic blow of the Super Typhoon to the telecommunications line to the telecommunications lines in Region 5 and the devastation of homes of both of faculty and students. It is inspiring to note that part of the rebuilding of the lives and opportunities in Region 5 after the catastrophic effects of Super Typhoon Rolly also involved government, academe, industry partnerships. As an example, the Bicol Foundation for Higher Education collaborated with Camarines North State College towards the launching of the Operation Bangon Bicolantia in order to pool funds towards the resuscitation of the Bicol region. Other initiatives include Project Sympathy of Catanduanes State University, wherein the university pooled funds for the provision of galvanized iron sheets that were used as roofing of distracted houses in the region. The Pete Master Foundation worked with Congressman Joey Salceda and Bicol University for the provision of 10,000 relief packs containing essential commodities and 195 sacks of rice benefiting the affected families of the typhoon. Undeniably, through the in indefatigable spirit of volunteerism of various public and private agencies. Our higher education institutions continue to become conduits of social transformation. As part of the Commission on Higher Education's continued response to these challenges is the strengthening of partnerships with government, academe, and industry, which led to the following initiatives. First is the launching of PhilCHED Connect. The Commission launched PhilCHED Connect as a free online and comprehensive knowledge resource platform that maintains higher education learning materials in text, media, and other digital assets. These online materials are useful for teaching, learning, and resource purposes and are universally accessed by both teachers and learners. As of the latest data, more than 1,609 content materials have been uploaded, engaging more than 60,412 unique users. Second is the Nationwide Caravan for CHED High Ed Bayanihan. The Commission launched the CHED High Ed Bayanihan to address the lack of familiarity and training of our faculty members to flexible learning modes. There were holistic and free teacher training and development programs through our collaboration with public and private HEIs, IT, and other business firms. The program offered various seminars and workshops that covered the following topics. Virtual classroom management, presentation making, facilitating learning, open and distance education, learning management systems, module design and development, various teaching strategies and methods, learning assessment, and the use of emerging technologies. Third, 
Making Campuses of State Universities and Colleges Smart. Pursuant to Section 10 of Republic Act No. 11494, also known as the Bayanihan to Recover as One Act, Congress has allocated a significant amount of funding to cover investments for ICT infrastructure, acquisition of learning management systems, and other appropriate equipment to fully implement flexible learning modalities for more than 100 public institutions of higher learning. During the virtual press conference of the CHED Chair held last June 23, 89 SUKs received a total of 1,958,432,005 pesos and 78 centavos to jumpstart the groundworks for, for smart campus universities and colleges to emerge in the country, wherein uh, we have state universities and colleges as the major recipients. Number four is the rationalization of the CHED CCAP grant. To ensure global competitiveness of our tertiary education graduates and provide concrete assistance to teaching personnel for the advancement of research and development, the Commission has released CHED Memorandum Order Number 6, Series of 2020, regarding the guidelines for the Scholarships for Instructors Knowledge Advancement Program, or the CCAP grant. This unique grant provides opportunities for higher education institutions teaching personnel or former HEI teaching personnel who wish to persevere in the academe, acquire their advanced degrees, and to serve the country. During this past few joint CEB and MANCO meetings of CHED, and in view of the growing demand for more faculty members to be capacitated under the new normal, the Commission has approved a set of amendments that would allow the CCAP grant to be more accessible and responsive to our faculty members by instituting much-needed reforms, such as but not limited to, first, is the streamlining the admission process to our regional offices, to ensure the slots are given to truly deserving recipients at a timely and judicious manner. Second, increasing the probability of completion of programs by ensuring that our scholars study on full-time basis only and to further augment such expectation. Increasing the amount of privileges higher than prevailing rates of higher than prevailing rates to secure a stable supply of applicants and stimulate superior academic performance from the scholars. The fifth one is the flexible delivery of student affairs and services. Another commendable initiative of the Commission in this time of COVID-19 pandemic is the implementation of the CHED Memorandum Order No. 8, Series of 2021, entitled Guidelines on the Implementation of Flexible Delivery of Student Affairs and Services or SAS programs during the COVID-19 pandemic. Through this measure, the Commission aims to pursue and retrofit the delivery of student affairs and services program during the pandemic through the partner HEIs focus on catering to mental health of students through various modes or options most appropriate to them. The guidelines shall adequately communicate the needs of our stakeholders and provide strategies for the effective delivery of flexible student affairs and services programs in all HEIs. This policy is also an affirmation that CHED is adamant in prioritizing the mental health and welfare of students and faculty members on top of the pressing concerns of Philippine higher education institutions. Next is the partnership with state universities and colleges and the local government units. Almost 28 universities have been temporarily used as quarantine facilities, benefiting more than 17,000 patients in their respective immediate localities. State universities and colleges have also partnered with other agencies, 
such as small-time independent makers and developers to make face masks and disinfectants for distribution to students and faculty. To date, almost 93 million pesos have been allocated to 59 HEIs for the said initiative. Next is the reconstitution of the technical panel for, for all discipline. The primary objectives of this initiative are the following. First is to develop a roadmap for the academic discipline programs responsive to the demands of the 21st century and the fourth industrial revolution. Second is to promote outcomes-based education anchored on the competitiveness and employability of the Filipino graduates. Third is to ensure accountability, transparency, and participation in policymaking and program institutional monitoring and evaluation. And last objective of this reconstitution of the technical panel is to institutionalize the representation of essential experts from the government, industry, academe for the various disciplines, policy, and standard recommendations. We have also the Centers of Excellence and Centers of Development Program, wherein the Commission recognizes that due to overwhelming, simultaneous, and rapid developments involving the various academic disciplines in their context, challenges, and innovations, both locally and abroad, existing policies and guidelines have become swiftly dated. Hence, CHED is doing it, its utmost best to revise the general criteria on identifying potential COEs and CODs across all programs as we align these new parameters to both current and future demands of our learners amidst an increasingly globalized world. This will also cover the important participation of the industry and government in the implementation of the COEs and COD mandates relative to the institution's leadership in the, in the community. Second, next initiative is our continuation to refine policies, processes, and programs to adapt to the new normal in higher education. The Commission has also introduced relevant guidelines, policies, projects, initiatives, and programs with the intent to effectively streamline international initiatives in higher education through the laudable pursuits of the Philippine government and its commitment to bilateral, multilateral, regional, and international agreements. Some of the noteworthy initiatives of the Commission on Internationalization are as follows. So we have the CHED Memorandum Order Number 55, Series of 2016, or the policy framework and strategies in the internationalization of the Philippine higher education. This proactive endeavor of the Commission aims to articulate the Philippine higher education internationalization policy to provide a national perspective and context for various initiatives related to the subject of internationalization. We have also CHED Memorandum Order Number 62, Series of 2016, or the policy standards and guidelines for transnational education programs. The Commission envisions to internationalize Philippine higher education to facilitate the development of human resource responsive to the needs of the times. And we have CHED Memorandum Order Number 22 Series of 2013, or the revised policy standards and guidelines on student internship abroad program. This comprehensive framework of the Commission on Student Exchange Programs serves as a catalyst in providing tertiary students the opportunity to acquire practical knowledge, skills, and desirable attitudes in recognized foreign host establishment or organizations in countries abroad. For this year, 2021, there has been substantial progress reached in making limited face-to-face -face classes a possibility, which includes in-person internships. Although flexible learning is still deemed the safest modality of learning under the current situation, the Commission recognizes that face-to-face -face delivery 
is necessary for courses where tactile, experiential, or hands-on learning is most crucial. Therefore, upon securing the approval from Malacanang, the Commission on Higher Education, and the Department of Health released the Joint Memorandum Circular Number 2021-001, or the Guidelines on the Gradual Reopening of Campuses of Higher Education Institutions for limited face-to-face -face classes during COVID-19 pandemic. Recognizing the vital need of providing additional manpower to support the Philippine healthcare system during this pandemic, six medical and allied health science degree programs, namely nursing, medical technology, physical therapy, medicine, midwifery, and public health, have been identified as priority programs permitted to conduct limited face-to-face -face classes. Two allied health programs have been added in the recent months, namely dentistry and radiologic technology. As of June 2021, 93 colleges and universities across the country are currently authorized to proceed with limited face-to-face -face classes and internships as duly certified by the respective CHED regional offices. These higher education institutions in the country have passed the health standards and stringent retrofitting imposed by the local and national government authorities to ensure a safe and conducive space for learning of our students. These institutions have been allowed to conduct limited face-to-face -face classes for the purposes of First, to, first, enabling students to achieve key learning outcomes on specialized laboratory courses and hospital-based clinical clerkship internship practicum and providing additional manpower to the country's healthcare system. During the high-level cultural forum on ASEAN held last May, I manifested to the panel of experts the following recommendations in the regional policy framework, which seeks to promote greater understanding, tolerance, and a sense of regional agenda among the people of ASEAN. And this includes the following. Adoption of culture-based education and the implementation of culture-based management and governance programs for local executives, diplomats, and foreign affairs stakeholders. Strengthening of the education tourism projects and initiatives of the member states through a framework of sustainable development goals. Revitalization and continuation of flexible learning modalities and schemes during and even after COVID-19 pandemic. Cross-sectoral and cross-pillar collaboration between ASEAN economic community and ASEAN sociocultural community through ASEAN Education Minister's meeting in implementing knowledge-based economy projects and initiatives. And the cross-border academic programs that will allow seamless delivery of internationalized and contextualized academic training and formation. Cognizant of the HEI's education, research, and service functions, Higher education institutions in the Philippines certainly have their agenda full in terms of collaborating and working with government agencies, other academic institutions, and the industry sector. We are definite that our colleges and universities are working constantly to address the adverse impacts of COVID-19 to the social, economic, political, and environmental facets of our society. As we recognize that much has been won in the fight against COVID-19, our higher education institutions must proceed to adapting to the now normal by focusing on future needs. As Chad reported during the Senate budget hearing deliberations, stated below are some areas for possible collaborations with our higher education institutions. First is the provision of continuing capacity building for faculty members, particularly on specialized and content-heavy courses. Second, resolving connectivity issues in higher education institutions, 
and addressing issues on software, hardware, and people wear, and on the advancement of smart campuses. Third, enhancement of mental health and support services to students and faculty members. Fourth, strengthening the quality of our teachers through responsive and innovative pre-service teacher education programs. And fifth, provision of support to research programs and initiatives related to futures thinking and the constant pursuance of the sustainable development goals. On my part, with Futures Thinking as one of my focal advocacies in the Commission, expect my responsibility of being the torchbearer of this young and growing academic field. I shall fulfill this by strengthening the discourse on Futures Thinking in the deliberation and development of new and comprehensive national higher education research agenda of the Philippines. This shall be accomplished through substantial consultations and other possible joint ventures such as the establishment and my spearheading of the Futures Thinking Consortium amongst various state universities and colleges in Region 5. If I may just share, I have spearheaded the Futures Thinking Consortium in higher education in Regions 5, 8, and 11. The objectives of this consortium were, first is to democratize access and utilization of concepts, tools, and frameworks involved in the Futures Thinking and strategic foresight among HEIs. Second is to establish an inclusive, indigenous, and responsive frameworks on futures thinking in the context of higher education development within the region. Third is to operationalize the regional framework on futures thinking through various programs and activities related to instruction, research, and community extension. Fourth is to develop a regional roadmap on the future of higher education in the region through futures thinking and strategic foresight, indicating the short-term, medium-term, and long-term objectives and target outcomes. And fifth, to foster and cultivate linkages and partnerships with local, regional, and international institutions and stakeholders from both the public and private sectors. The establishment of the Futures Thinking Consortium was supplemented with other initiatives of the Commission such as the establishment of the Technical Working Group for Smart Campus Implementation in all the state universities and colleges. Second is the creation of Technical Working Group with DepEd, TESDA, and PCW to intensify gender mainstreaming and gender sensitivity in the curricular offerings of basic education, technical, and vocational education and the higher education institutions. Third is the project called From Transition to Transformation, Building the New Landscape of Continuity and Connectivism in the Philippine Higher Education. Its key strategic imperative is to move Philippine higher education from the stage of trans transition due to the COVID-19 pandemic towards the stage of transformation focused on the new normal with emphasis on contextualizing, analyzing, and operationalizing new dimensions of continuity and connectivism between and among the Commission the greater higher education sector, and the stakeholders. During the meeting of the TWG, the members came up with two key result areas or KRAs as its undertakings. First is to have a clear change context, which means that there is a need to articulate the specific types, areas, drivers, and forms of change that Philippine higher education ecosystem will need to be mindful of Given, given the impact of COVID-19 and how it will be shaped the new normal. Second one is to have the agile responses towards transformation. This could be attained through a package of short-term, mid-term, and long-term responses that will analyze the transformation of Philippine higher education in the new normal. With these KRAs in mind, this TWG shall be able to recommend new paradigm, parameters, and purpose for higher education's transformation to a new landscape of continuity and connectivism. As our nation progresses in this battle against the pandemic, extraordinary collaborations between all stakeholders need to be instituted. 
Through partnerships and collaborations, stakeholders from all sectors of the society unite towards the improvement of education with our learners at the core of our collective societal transformation. Our universities and colleges will continue to serve their mandates to advance knowledge through, tech, to, through teaching and research and will continue to democratize technical expertise to their respective immediate communities. While our higher education institutions uphold these mandates, the Commission also secures its directive of coordinated partnerships with all the sectors of our society. The Commission affirms the conviction that it is through the Bayanihan spirit that Filipinos can rise above the crises and emergencies. This is an assertion of the Commission that tertiary education must espouse the notions, procedures, and processes of 21st century learning. The education of the new millennium connotes revolutionized approaches to realize excellent teaching and learning that are at par with international standards. This pandemic has surely taught us to fully realize that the Philippine higher education needs to be revitalized for future thinking. COVID-19 pandemic made us understand that we should shift from the, from the traditional schemes of education and adhere with the parameters of sustainable education instead. Again, my gratitude to the UST Alumni Association Incorporated for this given opportunity to impart some of the Commission's initiative to at least mitigate the effects of this health pandemic. May this catalyze further partnerships of the government and non-government agencies with the Commission on Higher Education as we continue to heal and learn as one. Thank you. Maraming maraming salamat, uh, Dr. Aldrin Darilag. Uh, maraming salamat po, Commissioner. Thank you for updating us with the with the uh, with the governance effort of our Commission on Higher Education. So in the meantime, uh, as we gather the questions, nako napakadami na po namin questions na kuha. We may not be able to finish it all, or we will not be able. But but rest assured, uh, this recording will be available. Uh, over our FB uh, uh, pages and also uh, sa mga iba't iba pong uh, emails nyo, padala nyo lang po para magkakuha po kayo ng kopya nito. But before we proceed with the open forum, just give us a few minutes uh, to gather all questions. Uh, for the meantime, uh, we'll be showing our videos to acknowledge our sponsors, Globe Telecom, CBRC, Radius Telecom, and Metro Rail Transit Corporation. So uh, pasalamat po muna tayo sa ating mga sponsors. Malaki ang apekto sa amin ng pandemic. Bagsak ang negosyo namin pero sinagit kami ng online selling. Kung hindi siguro dahil sa Globe, wala eh kasi nagtry ako ng iba. Wala eh. Very reliable ang network nila. Sa aming mga nagla-livestream, mahalaga yung maayos na koneksyon. Nakakaya pag naglalagang signal. Malaki na pinag iba ngayon. Okay na yung 4G eh. Pero mas lalo gumanda ng 5G. A live stream will not be possible kung hindi manakas ang signal ng Globe. Yung alam ko na 15 to 20 Mbps na speed, na doble na pala. Partida, 4G lang ang gamit ko nito. Ang laking bagay kasi pag yung video calling sa streaming, hindi naglalag. Pati yung pag-feed namin sa base, sobrang smooth na din. Ever since I'm using Globe, kaya kitang-kita ko ang improvement na nito. Because so much of our lives are online, if you get disconnected, Ready for our presentation, kids? Do you even exist? Welcome to the Red Light. Introducing Red Fiber. 100% fiber internet. A life with reliable connection. With flexible plans for different lifestyles. No worries of getting cut off. And dependable customer service. So when it matters most, you're always ready. Good job, Jacob. Get ready for the red life. Red fiber. Reliability redefined. Thank you so much. Uh, we, I would like to thank again our sponsors, Globe Telecom, CBRC, Carbalita Review Center, Vice, Radio Telecom, and Metro Rail Transit. 
Corporation. Thank you so much. I received a, a text na meron rin palang YouTube ang ating uh, UST uh, AAI uh, 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 organization. So let me welcome back again uh, our panelists, uh, uh, Dr. Aldrin uh, Darilag, uh, Commissioner. Good morning po. Uh, Siyempre si uh, Mr. Jeff Tarayao and si Engineer Don Paulino. Right? Welcome back. Morning. <laughs> Good morning. Oh, uh, we have few few minutes lang po uh, uh, for this uh, you know sharing no. Pero syempre, thank you so much sa inyong tatlo sa inyong iba't ibang mga inputs about our topic today which is all about the transitioning. Do our what do we need to do sa education institution to face the industry 4.0. Pero uh, commissioner, uh, tinanong ko na po kanina si <laughs> sila Jeff uh, saka si Engineer Don. Um How was your student life and uh, 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 yung student life nyo po nung time nyo? And then, how was your transition to employment? No? And then we get to, to, to speak about the more uh, serious matters, right? Uh, Dr. Aldrin? Uh, my student's life in UST was, uh, was very fruitful. Uh, it, it was a it was a very colorful formation of uh, our uh, Tomasian uh, educators. Um, I had a chance to uh, utilize all those uh, teaching or those Tomasian teaching in order for in order to, uh, for me to use uh, all of those uh, uh, teaching values as my framework for our for my. Uh, for my job no so yeah. i was able to utilize uh, the tomasian values in order for me to perform my duties and responsibilities in the workplace no uh, basically uh, uh, honestly speaking i i i'm uh, presently uh, um espousing all these uh, tomasian values in my work wow. as in, in the commission no? so the value of uh, honesty integrity uh the teachings of the of, of St. Thomas Aquinas, uh, mm -hmm. the Dominican teachings are deeply espoused in my uh, in work, uh, environment, in my workplace. No? So rest assured that uh, I, will, I will continue serving the country in a, in a Tomasian way <laughs> or in a Tomasian values. That's sweet. Thank you. Uh, th thank you, uh, Commissioner. So Aldrin, so now let's get into some of the questions. Medyo marami siya. And uh, but but I'll try to pick up uh, those that uh, I think are are really important to give attention to. So uh, I, I think uh, early on, we have a question uh, from Franz uh, Heronimo, and I think Engineer Don, you could respond to this. Sabi niya, transitioning to uh, artificial intelligence and importance of computer mo computer modeling software is now a trend in almost all industries. No, so ano daw po recommendation yon na major? para mag-study nito, right? Oo. Okay. Yeah. So, so I, I, I guess there's a lot of courses that are appearing now. Uh, one of them is really on data sciences. And, 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 and that's a, one of the fundamentals of artificial intelligence, one, yeah. one of the fundamentals of um, machine learning. So, so going through data sciences is an area a lot of people are looking at. Yeah, uh, uh, Jeff, I think this is some a point that you're harping on, right? O yung data management and data handling natin. Uh, and wh what can you say dito sa ating uh, mga educational institution? Saan sila mag invest now, no? Kasi ito mga data informatics and everything, no? Uh, mahalagang mahalaga to harness, uh, especially now na virtual tayo, online tayo. From your... Uh, 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 kumbaga, experience in the East industry. Uh, what do you think will be the direction to this? I think I think the data infrastructure is there already. I think mm -hmm. many of our schools and universities have the infrastructure already. It's the analytic side which we should mm -hmm. be able to improve. So yeah. again, it's skills building on the analytic side, no? Yeah. Both for administration, both for for let's say for example compute um, uh, customer experience yan yung mga dapat iniisip natin yan how to manage the data that we have because i think it's there already okay so there are data there are information 
And analysis of this in order for us to better understand how we behave is foremost. And I am happy probably si Dr. Aldrin could articulate on this yeah. kasi marami Marami, sabi ko, ang ganda talagang makinig pagka ganitong forum, no? Merong government, may industry. But Dr. Aldin did say things about what the CHED is doing when it comes to leveling up all this data management, data informatics thing through many, many projects that he identified. Dr. Aldin, can you articulate more and talk about how we from the private sector, yung mga private uh, ano, uh, universities can connect to all these projects ng CHED? I, I think basically, uh, one important uh, improvement that we need to realize is the improvement of our data management system in the commission. Mm -hmm. uh, this is in line with uh, uh, what is being done uh, by the different HEIs across the, the region, so both the private and the public. So, uh, Along with the improvements of the data uh, data management system of the of the different HEIs, there should also be uh, the harmonization uh, initiatives uh, between the CHED and the HEIs. Mm -hmm. Kasi ang problema kasi sa CHED is the data management system. Uh, I, I just want to be very honest with with all of you, eh? yeah. and that I, I think that's also uh, the problem. Uh, uh, that 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 we can uh, that we can experience or that we can get from the different HEIs also. No, so they 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 have already the data, but the problem here is how how the how how can they utilize the data? That, that, that I think that is the the big problem that is now being experienced by the different stakeholders. Uh, that's also a problem in CHED. No, so we have uh, we have all the data that is available mm -hmm. uh, in the office of the planning, uh, knowledge management, and research. But uh, how to utilize this data and how this data can be uh, can be the basis for the improvement of the policy standards and guidelines? I think that's the issue right now. So I, I think uh, the the harmonization of uh, the procedures between the commission and the different HEIs, both public and private, should be properly uh, realized here. Uh, let's, let's just take a, a very good example for the, for the gender and development program. So the PCW is now in close collaboration with the different agencies for the PCW, for the Philippine Commission on Women, to come up with uh, a data management system yeah. that will encompass all the concerns of the three education sectors, namely... DepEd, Ched, and Tesda. Mm -hmm. I, I think we have to we have also we have also to do the same. No, uh, the HEI should uh, properly collaborate with Ched and vice versa. Ched should also uh, properly collaborate with the different HEI so that uh, there will be what we call the harmonization of the data that will be available yeah. across the different HEIs and how to properly manage those data. Okay. Yeah, well, uh, Engineer Don, you have something to add? Uh -oh. Yeah, no, no, I just want to pick up with what Dr. Aldrin have, have, have said. Yes. Uh, because I think it's always good to talk about the data and the vastness in, in, in how much data that we actually have. But I think we always miss the point of what's the use of that data. So, so for, for me, I always go back to that fundamental and say, okay, why am I getting this data and what will it give me? And, and I think in any digitalization program or infrastructure that we put in, what is more important first to answer is the what and why. And then once you understand that, that's the time you actually start getting the data that, that you actually need. Because otherwise, it will just become a vast source of uh, nothing, right? Uh, with, even with all of those data that, that we actually have. Okay, wow, wow. Well, I just I just would like to mention to everyone na uh, yung YouTube channel natin uh, uh, meron tayo sa ano sa sa UST uh, uh, Alumni uh, Incorporated and also please uh, do uh, do uh, take good care of the uh, evaluation later pagkatapos ng sharing po natin. Okay. So, now um uh, for everyone, um how do we strike the balance um between academic and extracurricular activities of the students, right? Oh, ngayon, uh, for one, this is significant uh, transition 
a seamless partnership no i know that there are there are uh, uh, memorandum of uh, you know agreements no uh, on how to 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 doing it this so so how do we do this yung yung sa panahon ng pandemya opo uh, can you have some innovative um, suggestions on how we could do strike a balance between academic and all engagements with extracurricular activities uh jeff do you have an uh, okay yes uh, doc aldrin Yeah, we launched already the CMO number eight series of 2021. That's the latest CMO. It is all about the policy standards and guidelines for the flexible delivery of student affairs and services. Mm, okay. Mm -hmm. So, meron ng tinatawag na offline, online, uh, blended platform for us to uh, to attend to the needs of our students, no? Uh, both the curricular and extracurricular, especially yung mga student organization, there is already a platform that uh, that we already prepared for them, and even the 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 way we 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 address the mental health of our students, we have also the online mental health program. Mm -hmm. uh, hindi po ding uh, mahinto ang student affairs and services program. Yeah. Uh, kahit may pandemic, all the more that we should be addressing the concerns, the psycho-emotional concerns of our students. And that's the beauty of having the CMO number 8 series of 2021. Kaya para po sa mga practitioners ng Student Affairs and Services, mm -hmm. there is really also, there is an ongoing capacity building program for the Student Affairs Practitioners. Kasi yung iba, yung iba kasing Student Affairs Practitioners, nawawala na sila sa sa tamang direction pag COVID-19 pandemic na. I think uh, uh, there should be no student left behind during the COVID-19 pandemic, no? Uh, including the implementation of the student affairs and services. Thank you. Wow, wow, wow. Jeff, uh, do you have any uh, innovative way uh, to engage students, no? Uh, especially now, right? But it's, it's quite a challenge, no? Kasi let's say, for example, a lot of students are really emailing us seeking for internship opportunities. Correct. You know, mm -hmm. Opportunities that you could do at this time is really doing it online. So, you know, what I've noticed is that we've given them projects and most of them are research projects, but these are mm -hmm. desktop research projects. No, So um, if we're able to really maximize that kind of platform, at least for now, then there's still opportunity. But, you know, it's quite limited though. Okay. I would like to hear from Engineer Don. Engineer Don, meron ka bang isang mga creative ways uh, to, for, to engage students, no? even uh, with the industry, given the pandemic situation? Yeah. So, so I, I, I guess maybe if I can share what I do in class now. So I'm teaching <laughs> manufacturing uh, and industrial process at the uh, Dila South MPE. And, and, and for, for me, yet your first question was how relevant is extracurricular education itself? It, mm -hmm. It's very relevant. And I don't see a division in them. I see them as actually complementary with one another. Because for, for me, it goes back to engineering. Education talks about the technical part. But the people side, you actually learn it uh, being by being part of extracurricular activities. So the way I con con conduct my class now is not a lecture. So the way I do that now is uh, through yeah. facilitation. But at the same time, what we do is actually we do virtual site visits. So we will look for nice YouTube videos because they're mm -hmm. all available now on a particular site. Uh, in fact, we went, even went to um, United Launch Alliance, which is in Alabama, to actually see how a rocket uh, is made. And then from there, uh, from, that, from that visit, I actually ask a few questions for, for, for the class. And, and the questions that I ask is that if you're going to work in this particular area, uh, how do you actually make sure that the facility or what are the things that you will look for to actually make it safe, make it reliable, and make it efficient? So what we're trying to do in the class now is not just talking about the video. We're talking about what they will experience when they actually uh, come on site. And the other thing that I provide is I provide a perspective during that discussion on what the industry could look like for them and the experience that other people have. Now, the other part that I do in my class is through my network is every now and then, I invite uh, um, SMEs you know, and, mm -hmm. and uh, out of favor to them and say, look, please talk with my class. The students need you. 
And I think that, that, that the students for me reacted very positively on that because now they can have an interaction through their questioning ability to actually make it live for them what it's really like to work in the industry. So I, 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 I think while it's limiting right now that, that we cannot do actual site visits, I think as educators, we have different ways of doing it to allow the engagement and to allow the transfer of knowledge to happen. We just, we just really need to capitalize, as I've said, what we have right now. We have YouTube, we have Zoom, <laughs> we have lecturers that are yeah. outside the industry that can help us. Yeah. Oh, thank you for that. Uh, we are pressed with time, but I really have to uh, uh, get two more responses from, from the three of you. And, and I think uh, dahil papatapos na tayo, I think uh, the, my first question really uh, has something to do with the main topic of our uh, engagement today for this seminar. So because we're talking about transitioning amidst COVID and Dr. Aldrin was able to explain to you, to us everything but that's happening now with the educational sector. Uh, my, my hope is to learn from you now uh, the direct answer to our question, what do us educational institutions have to do to prepare for the workforce for the industry 4.0 with the pandemic context, right? Uh -oh. Probably you could you could say one or two uh, 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 learning points, right? Uh -oh. So what do you, do we uh, have to do sa, sa educational institutions so that we could prepare uh, for the workforce for the industry 4.0, right? Uh, I could start with, with Jeff. Can I start with you? Okay, I think two things. No, first is um. You, you have to ask yourself as an educational institution, am I industry 4.0? Mm. I think to be able to really, for, for the students to be able to experience ng hindi nagugulat pag talon sa, sa workplace, that yung lugar na pinag-aaralan ko ba, reflective na of the, of the, uh, of the factors of industry 4.0. Pangalawa yeah. is we have to broaden our partnerships, no? broaden our ecosystem beyond the usual partners and beyond the usual partnerships. No? Hindi yung, I mean, kailangan shared innovation, shared research, mm -hmm. things like that. It, the, the academe now is part of, um, it's a, of oh. a bigger ecosystem <laughs> of learning yeah. where even us in the corporation should also upskill through the university. You, you know, corporations have... Um, Ang mahal maggrant ng corporate university. Oh wow! But, but if it's but if we have universities like USD offering for even employees new skills, new points of view, new perspectives, then we could harness that and even contribute to the you know to that the the chest of learning mm -hmm. that uh, ano that the university will have. Kaya ang sinasabi ko the growth of your intellectual capital, di ba? Should yes. be continuous in the university and you can just maximize the partnership with you know government corporations industries communities uh, in that so i think that's how we could really survive with industry 4.0 or any industry evolution that may happen thank you jeff uh, uh, uh engineer don same question <laughs> i guess the, the one thing i would encourage all of us to do is to give space and opportunity for our students to ask more questions because we're, we're so in the classroom that we have, we're so used to just telling the students what to do. I think the environment has changed now with the data and information that is available. I think what we need to start training our students more and encouraging more in our classrooms is actually to ask the questions. And really, when they ask the question, allow the class to actually delve deeper in those questions. If it, it retrospective, not reflective, and and what have you, right? Oh, thank you, Engineer Don. Uh, Dr. Aldrin. Yeah, thank you. I have uh, four important uh, reminders to our work group. No, so in order for us to properly engage in the now normal environment. Yeah. I, hindi naman daw new normal. It's a now normal. No? <laughs> yes. Uh -huh. So number one, I I think we have to espouse. Uh, very comprehensively, the notions and uh, the processes, the procedures of the 21st century learning and the industry 4.0. I think uh, 
it's it's not it's not any more industry point uh, 4.0 in the in the in reality but uh, we are now in the industry 5.0 Mm-hmm. So I think uh, espousing the notions, the processes, the procedures, the parameters of the 21st century and the industry 4.0 is the is the number one thing. No? Second, uh, I think we have to continue collaborating with uh, our partner institutions, and there should be what we call an utmost presentation of integral approach in the curriculum development. You know, curriculum innovation and curriculum implementation. So, so Chad, because the technical panel namin ngayon ay uh, integrated, no? Hindi lang represented ng akadim. Mm-hmm. Ang technical panel namin th- that is now crafting the curriculum uh, came from the different sectors. Mm-hmm. Uh, one, uh, one came from the government. Uh, one representative came from the akadim, public and private. Another representative came from the organization. Another an, another representative came from the industry. So kung makikita natin, ang programa na, na itatalaga, na ipoformulate ng technical panel is really integrated. Because all the insights, all the inputs would come from the different sectors. Mm-hmm. So hindi na katulad dati na akadim lang ang pinapakinggan. Ngayon ang pinapakinggan natin, yes, ang pinapakinggan natin iba't ibang sektor. Kaya pag gumawa tayo ng policy standards and guidelines, that is the product of the concerted efforts of the different representatives coming from the different sectors. Okay. Okay. Num- number three, we should be a future thinking and uh, future future thinking uh, individual, mm-hmm. no? Uh, we should really espouse or we should really imbibe uh, future thinking scenarios and we should adapt the strategic foresight scheme. No? I uh, discussed ko na yan sa aking speech. No? So yeah. uh, we, should, we should transform our universities and colleges future-proof universities and colleges. Yeah. And lastly, wag natin kakalimutan yung internationalization initiatives. Mm-hmm. So we really have to uh, put this as uh, one of our priority areas in education, the internationalization of education and, uh, and uh, the adoption of the transnational education in our uh, programs and initiatives in our universities and colleges. So yun lamang po yung apat na, <laughs> apat na malalaking uh, Yeah. Uh, proseso at uh, proyekto na iiwanan ko sa grupo. Maraming salamat yes. po. Salamat. Mukhang, mukhang maraming uh, we have to work more for, for all these things. Pero I was being told that uh, uh, all those questions that were posted over the chat will be responded to. We will give it to the person in charge. Marami po, uh, Doc Aldrin, na tanong sa Ched, right? <laughs> yes. So, so bibigyan na lang po namin yung mga questions sa inyo, sa inyong tatlo, and we hope that we could, you know, there will be a response within two or, th- or three weeks no? uh, para ma- mag-respond po sa inyo. But in yes. any case, um, uh, I will have to ask the indulgence of everyone here because you know what? Uh, this process, uh, these things that we're talking about now involves young people, the Filipino youth especially, who will be transitioning from this world of pandemic into finding the difficult time of employment during pandemic. So, uh, gusto ko manggaling po sa inyo, uh, because I'm a sociologist of youth, gusto ko po manggaling sa inyo, pwede niyo po bang kausapin sila? Can you assure them? <laughs> I do not know what you're going to tell our young people studying now. There was a chat, sinasabi niya, nakagraduate siya, uh, nag, 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 pasa na siya sa board, pero wala siya nakitang trabaho, right? And we're talking about transition. And my standby study clearly identifies the fact that, yeah, there is a higher probability na magkakagap year ka na ngayon because of what's happening, right? Because it's not that you don't like to work. It's only that there is no work. So as an ending <laughs> from the three of you, how can you assure <laughs> us? Unahin ko si Doc Aldrin. Short lang. Doc Aldrin, si Engineer uh, 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 Don, saka si Jeff, right? Doc Aldrin, uh, talk to our young people now. Ay, nakamute po kayo, Doc. For, for our students out there, I, uh, that, this would be an assurance that I can give you. No? So as, uh, as an oversight commissioner of student affairs and services, 
I am in constant communication with our partners. No? So, uh, I can easily collaborate with all our students through our uh, association, with our organization. And we can uh, all together address uh, issues and concerns of our students. No? Uh, I'm just uh, a message away from... Uh, uh, from our students, no, so we can we can easily address those issues. Because I'm in constant collaboration with with TAPSAS, uh, with uh, with all other uh, organizations uh, that uh, that that uh, in which the main concern is the student welfare and development. And uh, this is my commitment, and this is my obligation to all our students that I will continue uh, uh, initiating projects and initiatives for for the CHED to properly address the, the concerns of our students in this COVID-19 pandemic and even the post-COVID post-COVID uh, uh, post-COVID uh, uh, life. Uh, post life or post-COVID scenario. No? Thank yeah. you. Thank you so much. Uh, Engineer Don, talk to our students now. <laughs> uh, this is tough. No? Pero, pero, let, 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 let me give it a try. Um, as an educator myself, I... I, I been listening to my students, students on the challenges of online learning, the COVID pandemic, and how they actually manage their time. But I guess for, for, for me, I have a perspective. Um, a lot of us pre-pandemic have not passed through this challenge. And I think as students of today, you have actually learned something more important than being in the classroom. If you learn the importance of perseverance, you've learned the importance of patience, You've learned the importance of self-discipline. And most of all, through this pandemic, you've learned the importance of caring for one another. I think regardless of what industry number that we will transition to in the future, all of these things that you have learned are actually very important and key to success of our country and to, our, and to your own success. So please continue to leverage on these learnings. Please continue to reach out and continue to collaborate, not just with your students, but to the professors, to the teachers, to the industry that you want to belong with in the future. Thank you, Engineer Don. Uh, Jeff, it's your turn, Mr. Jeff. <laughs> Talk to our students. Uh, para sa ating mga mag-aaral, kung ano man ang tong sasabihin ko, eh, ito rin yung natutunan ko nung mag-aaral ako. No? So, um, Paulit-ulit lang siya at yan yung uh, sandigan na meron tayo. Una, we're all in this together. No? Uh, hindi tayo nag-iisa, hindi kayo nag-iisa. Lahat tayo masayaman o mahirap o um, difficult yung pagkakataon. We have to all work together. And we have to open ourselves to whatever opportunities ang dumating sa atin. At pag dumating yung opportunity na yan, you just have to blossom where you are planted. And you will be rewarded with so many things. Sometimes unexpectedly. So maraming salamat sa inyong lahat. Wow. Pwede bang may palakpak naman dyan na sound effect, right? Oh. <laughs> yeah. Okay. In that, on that note, uh, I have to tell you that it's a privilege to, to have known the three of you, fellow Thamashians, uh, to join you with us to talk about you know, an important issue that will affect our future, right? Or not only the future of students, but tayo, tayo lahat yung future po natin. So I am so pleased uh, to award virtual certificates, no? Oo. Sigurado po kami, mapiprint po namin to, mapapadala po namin to sa inyo. But let me, <laughs> let me just show you, pwede bang i-show natin the certificate that will be given to each of our uh, uh, speakers. It reads University of Santo Tomas, uh, UST Alumni Association Incorporated, in partnership with the Graduate School Center for Continuing Professional Education and Development, this Certificate of Appreciation is hereby awarded to for having generously shared his expertise and experience in Webinar 1, Transitioning the Graduates to Industry 4.0 Workplace of the National Multi-Sectoral Summit for Educational Transformation and Academic Alumni Industry Government Collaboration. Given this September 3, 2021, at the Royal and Pontifical Catholic University of Santo Tomas, España Boulevard, Manila, Philippines, via Zoom, right? Signed, Associate Professor Jocelyn F. Agkawili, 
Director of the Center for Continuing Professional Education and Development, Dean Henry S. Tinedero, a convener, uh, AAIG 2021 Chairman of the UST Alumni Association Incorporated, and of course, Professor Evelyn A. Song, PhD, President, UST Alumni Association Incorporated. So I am happy to share with you the Certificate of Appreciation to uh, Engineer Rolando J. Paulino Jr. Yeah, and siempre. <laughs> Thank you, Engineer Don. And so also we have for Mr. Jeffrey O. Tarayao. Yeah. Sir Jeff, thank you so much. Receive it with, an, uh, with a virtual hug. And also our dear commissioner, Dr. Aldrin A. Davilag, uh, commissioner of the Commission on Higher Education. Uh, commissioner, thank you so much. Thank you, thank you, and okay, congratulations. Thank you, maraming, maraming, maraming salamat po. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, sa pagkakataon pong ito, uh, I am tasked to, to give an overview of what has transpired for this first webinar of the AAIG. Uh, I would like to, you know, to, to just say na I think I am overwhelmed with so much gratitude for witnessing so many ideas and listening to many ideas that can really pump us, perk us to, uh, to face uh, the world despite the pandemic. Uh, pero para mas simple lang, tingin ko may tatlong, uh, tatlong UST, UST lang ang pwedeng mag-synthesize ng mga nangyari ngayong umagang to. Una, I really learned you for me is understanding, right? Oo. I think uh, ito yung sinasabi ni Engineer Don uh, uh, and, 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 and the rest, si Jeff, saka si uh, Doc Aldrin. No? Alam nyo, sa gitna ng lahat ng ito, huwag natin kakalimutan yung kahalagahan ng research, yung kahalagahan ng data, yung kahalagahan ng pagtingin sa konteksto. I think understanding is a generic term, but it is a quite a powerful term because it will allow us to, to know what is happening, the situation, right? While listening to, uh, to Dr. Aldrin, I've been, you know, uh, I've been reminded by a lot of social issues that we are in, that we have a nation. Meron tayong nasyon na kailangan ng tao para i-build. We, we, we have... I think it's a call for citizenship if you're going to ask me. The understanding should be transforming into some kind of a response, right? Kaya nga, paano naman tayo magre-respond? Yung pangalawa, skill, right? Skills, right? Ito yung sinasabi kanina ni, uh, ni Jeff saka ni Engineer Don, right? I think it's very important for us to gain skills and that the new educational era will be all about skills, right? But not only academic skills, but also all other skills that we learn. More importantly, human skills, social skills, relationship. That's why in every presentation that we listen to, we know that partnership is important, that communication is important. Dapat magsama-sama tayo. Ang isang policies, standards, and guidelines ay hindi lang ginagawa ng mga nagtuturo subalit nagpa-practice din ng uh, ng ano ng ng profession. I think that's powerful and that's that that, that I think is a beautiful uh, sociological discovery that we have that we really need to make sure that we provide skills while we're teaching not only in the mind but also in the heart. I love engineer Don whenever he he, he humanizes, you know, the, the discussion saying that you know what Hindi lang, hindi lang tayo engineer, tayo yung mga tao din. Hindi lang tayo, hindi lang tayo teacher, tayo foremost human beings that we have to go beyond that and that it's really caring that's most important. Ang, so understanding you, S is skills, and T for me is technologies. Wherever you look at it, I think T, technologies is something that weaves into the presentation of today's webinar. Technologies in many ways, no? Uh, it's not just the technology of hardware, but also the technology of software. The many projects that CHED is doing right now, given the pandemic, given the limited resources, given the lack of trust maybe, okay, that we have in the polity, given the, the many problems that we have, no? Even in the church, in our society, in our barangay, 
And listening to Dr. Aldrin saying that he is actually in chat talking about the Thomasian virtues and values, the Thomasian value of being honest, no? uh, the Thomasian virtue that we, we, we learn from, 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 from our institution that we will be for the truth, not for corruption, but for the truth. Whatever industry it would be, I know that we will continuously struggle, but in that struggle, if we understand, if we have the skill and we make use of good technologies, I think we are prepared to face what the post-COVID era will be for us. With that, thank you so much for everyone. And I have some, uh, some reminders for, uh, 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 before we finally close, okay? So uh, I would like to encourage everyone to please if, uh, uh, fill up the evaluation form uh, to be sent to your V address. Certificates will be provided after the submission of your completed evaluation form. If you have any question, please send an email to aaigsummit2021 at gmail.com. And to view our recording today, you could visit our FB pages of the UST AAI, UST GSCC PED, and CBRC VICE. Just a reminder, uh, the next webinar will be on September 17, 2021 at 9 a.m., okay? And uh, we will have uh, webinar two on September 17, also 9 a.m. with uh, Dr. Alberto Victor Phoenix, Mam Rolanda Urdaneta, and Mr. Ramon M. Lopez. So they will be talking about Industry 4.0, disruptions, disturbances, and disorders. So I would like to uh, 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 encourage everyone to attend the next webinar and invite your colleagues. No, uh, Hanggang ngayon, meron pa tayong more than 300. That is good. And we have more uh, audience sa FB Live natin. So it is my honor and pleasure to thank again our guest speakers for today's webinar. And if you would like to know more about their information and presentation, you can access our website uh, at uh, www.ustalumniassociation.org, AAIG 2021 Summit. So sa website po, ilalagay po namin ang ating, uh, uh, ating presentation and the biographies of our guests. Also, I would like to thank all of our sponsors, Globe Telecom, CBRC Vice, Radio Telecom, and Metro, uh, Metro Rail Transit Corporation. And most especially, the people behind here, sila Kuya Henry, sila Mama Songko, everyone, uh, sila Ma'am Agkawili, thank you so much. Si John, na, na tumutulong sa akin, sila Kay, and everyone, sila Aaron, everyone, I cannot name you all, uh, but uh, all those, uh, you know, uh, working together, yung UST Alumni Association, thank you so much, yung aming mga mother, yung aming mga father dyan, yung aming community, thank you so much for all these things. Siguro, bilang panghuli, kailangan, uh, palakpakan naman natin ng isa't isa for this wonderful, I think successful uh, uh, webinar, number one. Thank you so much. And so, to conclude this webinar, it will not be a conclusion without, of course, together, let us sing the UST hymn. God bless and thank you. See you sa next webinar po. Thank you so much. Thank you.
po, mahabol pa po natin yung iba. We will have a photo opportunity now. Yeah, hey, thank you so much. Congratulations. Let's have a photo opportunity po for everyone. Please open your uh, camera. And uh, I think uh, CBRC will be taking photos, right? Or, or Aaron? Aaron, ikaw ba mag-take <laughs> ng photo? Uh -oh. Okay, game. Oh. Sige po. Uh, thank you, Commissioner. Na. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you po. Thank oh, you. Welcome back. Welcome back. Oh. And thank you, Jeff. And uh, of course, Don. Thank you. Welcome Hello po. back po. Hello po sa mga dati kong teachers. <laughs> Photo off tayo, photo off. Ready? One, two, three. Yung iba, di ba magpapakita yung iba? Nahihiya po, nahihiya. Magpakita kayo. Teka, isang set pa po. Miss Kay. Thank you so much, Manny. Next one, two, three, go. Miss Kay. Thank you, Rima. Thank you for the privilege. Miss Kay, kau naman. Apa sih tu na? Thank you po. Thank you so much. Apa? Magbi meeting pa po ba? Nako, thank you, Doctor Peralta. Thank you. Thank you, Kuya Yayet. Salamat po. Thank you, Yayet. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, John. Thank you, John. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Very good. Congratulations. Thank you, Yayet. Welcome, Jeffrey. Kayo pa. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Salamat po. Congratulations. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you, CBRC. Thank you, Dr. Carl. Thank you, Carl. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. Thank you. 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 Thank you.